So I'm Rosie Wilkham from Peace Child International, and I'd like to welcome you to the first of our workshops celebrating the UN 75th anniversary. We've got an amazing panel of experts in their field from UK, Switzerland, Italy, South Africa, United States, Zimbabwe, Nigeria, Slovenia, and Sierra Leone. And I think it's very fitting that we should start off our week of workshops with health and security, something that is uppermost on our minds at this moment. And tonight we're going to look at, be looking at what have we learned from the pandemic that will help us all to improve healthcare in the future. So this is how it's going to work tonight. We're going to hear from Professor David Heyman, followed by an introduction from our chair, Dame Sally Davis, and then there will be five breakout groups. We have pandemic, pandemic preparedness, non-communicable diseases, universal access to health care, and we'll be looking at digital medicine, universal mental health for all, and maternal, newborn, and adolescent health care. But first of all, we're going to have a few words from Professor David Heyman. My name is David Heyman, and I'm what's called a field epidemiologist. I've spent my career looking at outbreaks, looking at infectious diseases around the world, and trying to make sense of them and understand how they can best be controlled. I began my career um, actually in London. I finished the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine in a course on tropical diseases because I was a medical doctor and wanted more experience in tropical diseases. I was recruited from the school to go to, with the World Health Organization for two years in India working on smallpox eradication, and that's really the first time I ever understood what WHO really was. I worked in the smallpox eradication program actually in 1967 when the program began based on a recommendation from WHO. There were 2.7 million people dying from smallpox each year. By 1980, through this collaborative effort during the Cold War, when Russians and Americans worked side by side, smallpox was eradicated and no longer is an infectious disease in human populations. After that, my career led me to Sub-Saharan Africa, where I worked for 13 years, and I really understood the importance of the World Health Organization in providing guidance to countries because they needed guidance that was unbiased, guidance that was based on evidence, and they got that from WHO. And so I realized that WHO was really an important contributor to global health in Africa. I then went on to work actually with WHO, and during that period of time, I saw many incredible things happening at WHO. For example, in 1988, WHO passed a resolution to eradicate polio. There were a 1,000 children being infected each day in 125 countries in 1988. Today, because of the eradication effort and because of work of all countries together, there are less than 50 cases of polio occurring at present. And those are occurring in only two countries, Afghanistan and Pakistan, and soon we believe polio will be eradicated. WHO also formed a treaty on tobacco control, and it's because of that treaty that smoking has decreased in many countries throughout the world, including here in the United Kingdom, where it's down to about 17% of the population. So WHO does a lot in public health around the world, and it's today working, despite geopolitical tensions, in understanding the epidemic or the pandemic of COVID-19 and making real-time guidance for countries to use as they fight this pandemic. Since the beginning of the pandemic, I've been chairing an advisory group at the World Health Organization that's been advising countries on how to deal with the pandemic. Um, this is quite an amazing group to me because Whenever we request information from any country in the world, we have it immediately, despite the geopolitical tensions that are occurring. And this information has helped us to understand how best to deal with the outbreaks and the pandemic as it moves around the world and how not to deal with it. And the most important thing at present is to deal with the outbreak now and not wait for a vaccine or for a therapeutic, which we hope will come, but may not come. 
And so lessons learned, especially in Asia, have told us that what we need to be doing is, number one, we need to make sure that people are at the base of the pandemic control. They need to understand how to protect themselves and protect others, including those who are at greatest risk of serious illness if they become infected, such as the elderly and those with comorbidities. We also have learned from Asian countries that what's extremely important is track and trace or contact tracing. Not only forward contact tracing to identify people who might be infected because they were a contact and, is and isolating them to decrease transmission into the community, but also backward contact tracing to understand where people are getting infected so that those areas can be surgically shut down and then opened up again once they understand how better to protect people coming to their establishment, for example, if it's a restaurant or a pub. At the same time, there are other measures that are necessary, including making sure that the hospital system doesn't become overburdened. And there's lots that's going on now that will benefit either this pandemic later on or future pandemics, including this whole realm of digital health, where we're beginning to see how mobile telephones and other digital apparatus can really help us in dealing with outbreaks. But we have to remember that at the base of successful response to this pandemic will be community involvement and people understanding how they can protect others and protect themselves. And I'm very happy to be speaking at this conference because this is where the grassroots really begins. And pandemic response has to be from the grassroots up rather than from the center down. The center, the central government can provide a facilitating environment but it's people who themselves can deal with this pandemic best. Well, Professor Heyman is a hard act to follow, but if anyone can do it, because he's our chair for this evening, Dame Sally Davis, former Chief Medical Officer to England and the UK Special Envoy for Antimicrobial Resistance, AMR, and champion of AMR across the fields of human health, animal health, agriculture, the environment, well, everything. Appointed Dame Cross Order of the Order of the Bath for Services to Public Health and Research in the 2020 New Year's Honours, Dame Sally is now the Master of Trinity College, Cambridge. Dame Sally, it's an honour and a relief to hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Rosie. That's very kind of you to hand over to me. And thank you too to David Heyman. I remember interviewing him for Public Health England. And wow, what a starry career he's had in global health. And I would agree that the response to the pandemic starts with the people and works upwards. We know that we're lucky when we have an effective WHO, but he brought to our attention the eradication of smallpox, the control of polio. Not bubbling out inside our yeah. So I'm really delighted to be here today to chair this health and security workshop in the context of the UN's 75th anniversary. It's a really appropriate time to be celebrating such a milestone when collaborations and coordinations between all levels and across all geographies are no longer a luxury, but a necessity. Indeed, I would argue we're at a crossroad as the impacts of COVID-19 continue to transverse the role of the world and a second wave is moving across Europe. We have a choice to make. Will we simply respond to the here and now, or do we take a moment to stop look up and see beyond the horizon of this pandemic towards the next one, because, you know, there will be a next one. COVID-19 is neither the first nor the last health emergency we're going to face. Scientists estimate that we will face a health emergency at least once every five years from here on. And there's a chance this is an optimistic scenario. The reality could be far worse. Let us pray that as they come, they are more contained than COVID-19 is. But recognizing this, we can and must say never again and take action. As David so rightly pointed out, taking action has to happen at every level from governments, but also grassroots up. 
Individual and community efforts are important and can make a difference. Yet, without adequate partners to scale up these efforts, many initiatives can fall short of the immense potential they show. That's why having open discussions, as we're doing today in the context of this workshop, and fostering partnerships across sectors and across all levels of society is more important than ever. It is our responsibility to turn this crisis into an opportunity to do better. And how can we do better? Well, the first step is recognizing that solutions we need could come from anyone and anywhere. Preparedness requires the best minds across a range of disciplines and sectors, our economists, our behavioral and molecular scientists, our data experts, these and others are all critical players in the promotion and protection of global public health. We need to reject siloed thinking. We need to leave barriers behind. We need to question assumptions about who can help in this crisis and open our horizons for change. This presents us with opportunities, opportunities to come together, to learn, share, co collaborate today and in the future. Hence, workshops like this. Opportunities to identify and move forward our very best thinking, such that we're able to identify, respond, and recover from health emergencies like COVID-19. Opportunities to better use data and analytics to strengthen and improve global public health, and an opportunity to address the slow pandemic also of antimicrobial resistance. I do believe that this is a moment in history when we have a chance to think differently. We have not only the responsibility to do better, but for now at least, we have the opportunity. And we have to work with the WHO, with the UN, with everyone. So I'm immensely excited to hear from our breakout groups today, and I will shortly hand off to Damien to start the group conversations. It's going to be interesting to hear the rapporteurs tell us what actions the panelists believe can be taken at every level to ensure we ensure we take the opportunity we've been presented with to respond better, to be more prepared, and then respond it yet better in the future. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Hopefully you can hear me OK. Um, my name is Samuel Boland, joining you today from London, England. I'm currently a consultant COVID-19 public health advisor at the American INGO Mercy Corps, and also I'm a global health researcher at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, focusing on how to most effectively respond to public health emergencies and disease outbreak responses. I've spent a fair bit of time uh, responding to disease outbreaks, uh, including COVID-19, Ebola in Sierra Leone, and Ebola in DRC. And I'm joined today on uh, the panel that I am chairing by some phenomenal panelists that have extensive experience responding to disease outbreaks for the UN, for INGOs, for NGOs, academic institutions, and for governments. And that includes Angus Tengbe Faia, currently a researcher at Queen Mary University in Edinburgh, Aaron Polich, who is based in Boston, Massachusetts, Marcela Ascantar Rodriguez, currently working for the INGO Mercy Corps based in Goma in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Simone Carter, working for UNICEF and currently based in Kinshasa, DRC, and Rachel Fletcher, who I don't know where she normally is, uh, in as much as she's always traveling around from different countries to Bangladesh and Yemen for public health emergency response work, but I do know today is joining us from London as well. So together, we will be hosting the Health Emergencies and Pandemic Preparedness Panel. We're going to be talking about our experiences responding to various disease outbreaks and public health emergencies, including what we have seen that we think works well and what we have seen that we think does not work well or maybe has even caused harm. We'll discuss the role of different actors and stakeholders, lessons learned, as well as opportunities for improving public health emergency and disease outbreak responses, including resilience and maximizing preparedness. So please do join us into the pandemics panel if you find that of interest. That's room number one for pandemics. Thank you very much, Damien. Um, and good evening to everyone with us. Uh, my name is Dr. Ibia Adoki, and I'm a junior doctor working in hospitals in and around the Oxford region in the UK. Um, over the past few years, I've worked in various different medical specialties, um, including acute medicine, cardiology, 
um, in gastroenterology as well in G as in GP surgeries. Um, so my breakout group this evening will be on the topic of non-communicable diseases. Um, so these are diseases that can't be transmitted or that aren't contagious, um, the most notable of which include things like cancer, heart disease, strokes, um, obesity and lung diseases as well. As you can imagine, these diseases affect millions of people worldwide um, and, or, and have done for a number of years. But also they are closely bound up with the social circumstances of, of various patients and people and also with public health initiatives. Um, it's, it's very important, obviously, that we're approaching all these discussions in the context of a global pandemic. So our focus in our breakout group will be to try and draw some parallels between the two, between the management of um, transmittable diseases like viruses, but also non-communicable diseases. I have a fantastic panel that I'm really excited to hear more from this evening, um, who have a lot of expertise in a lot of subsections, including screening and medical education, as well as risk factor management. Um, so if any of this sounds interesting, then please do join us in breakout room two. Thank you very much. You. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. This is Ginny Arnold from WHO in Geneva, and really delighted to hear both David Navarro and Sally Davis talk about the importance and the work that my organization does. I've had the real privilege to work with WHO for the last 20 years, and I normally work on tobacco control and social determinants. Uh, so I was delighted to hear David talk about tobacco control. And of course, there is an incredible link, as we know, between tobacco use and COVID. But like most of my colleagues, for the last eight months, we've all been supporting the COVID-19 response. And I'm really delighted to chair the Digital and Universal Healthcare Group. Universal Healthcare is very much the pillar of the work in WHO. It's about getting people quality, affordable health services wherever they live in the world. And WHO recommends the universal health care is based on a primary health care approach. In my panel, we will be talking about what we've learned during the COVID outbreak in relation to UHC and digital health. And as David mentioned in his introduction, digital health has been an explosion over the last eight months, both to get people aware of what's happening, to give health information, as well as to offer treatment and services from remote. We've got a fantastic panel. We have got health technology experts who are working with, within the private sector. We've got academics, we've got researchers, and we've got policy experts. If you join our session, you will meet Abimbone Adikbakian from Nigeria. You'll meet Wasi Ihas from the UK, Sirianu Madikani from Kenya, Cassandra Kinde from the UK, and Jay Himmelstein from the US. So if you're interested in digital, interested in technology, or interested in universal healthcare, do join our breakout group. Look forward to meeting you. Um, my name is Claire Copleston, and I'm a director of a community interest company called Meaningful Education. Um, I'm also the author of Activity Guru, a book based on health and social care. And I'm a trustee at the National Dignity Council, um, and we promote good quality care standards and best practice enabling choice, independence and dignity. This evening, you can join us in our, in our workshop um, and we will be discussing um, how accessible are our healthcare services. Um, and we will also be discussing in exploring the impact of the pandemic on intergenerational emotional separation and how that impacts on mental health and wellbeing followed by what more needs to be done in the way of education. 
Uh, hello and welcome and, and thank you for joining us tonight. It's a privilege to be part of such an interesting discussion. So my name is Dr. Sue Broster. I'm a consultant neonatologist uh, working in the NHS in Cambridge in the United Kingdom. I'm also the Global Officer for the Royal College of Paediatrics and Child Health in the UK and a committee member of Cambridge Global Health Partnerships. And I invite you to join a conversation around maternal child and adolescent health this evening with Dr. Emily Tumwakiri, who is working as a family physician in a community hospital in southern Uganda, and Claire Hanbury, Director of Children for Health, an expert in promoting the participation of children in healthcare, discussing the impact, really, of the pandemic on maternal and child health, what we've learned, and what we might do differently looking forward. Often considered Cinderella services, I think, maternal, child, and adolescent health services, it's important to remember the children are our future, and there is a real opportunity to think together about how we can support them to have the future they deserve. And I look forward to many of you joining the conversation this evening. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today. As uh, I've already introduced myself, my name is Samuel Boland and I am chairing this pandemics panel. We've only got about 40 minutes to speak with you today. Uh, and we have a ton of experience on this amazing panel to hear from, so we're going to get started. As you know, today we're going to talk about health emergencies and pandemic preparedness, although the terms I tend to use are public health emergency and disease outbreak preparedness, because of course, not all disease outbreaks do lead to epidemics or pandemics, but it's nevertheless important to prepare for them, or better yet, prevent them from happening in the first place. Before jumping into our discussion, though, I would like to do a brief round of introductions. So I'm going to call out the panelists in alphabetical order to introduce yourselves. Um, when I call on you, uh, if you could just quickly unmute your microphone, say your name, where you're calling in from, your current job role, and maybe take 30 seconds or so just to explain your background, roles and experiences that you have related to responding to health emergencies and disease outbreaks. So uh, not to put you on the spot, Angus, but as your name does begin with an A, um, I will start with you. Could you just unmute your mic, tell us where you are in the world, what you do, and a little bit about your background in disease outbreak response. Thanks, Sam. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Angus, Angus Fayatengbe. I'm joining you in from Sierra Leone today. So I work uh, for the Queen's Margaret University in Edinburgh. I'm, uh, I'm a PhD candidate. I'll be studying uh, health policies, how they are made, and how we implement them in resource poor settings. So for my background, I have been working on the Ebola outbreak since um, it started in 2014. I've been working as a responder, and I also worked um, as a researcher working on vaccine trials. So that's just a short background about me. Thank you, and welcome, everybody. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Aaron Pulich, and I am calling in today from Boston, Massachusetts. I've spent most of the last decade working in East, West, and South Africa um, on various health system strengthening and emergency response uh, programs, uh, including conflict response, um, droughts and famines, and also the Ebola outbreak in Sierra Leone. Uh, I've spent the last three years actually working here in in Boston for the Boston Public Health Commission, uh, which is our local board of health, um, and specifically working on pin, er, public health preparedness, uh, and have spent much of this last year working on COVID response, as you might imagine. Uh, I recently actually took up a new role uh, where I'm now providing technical assistance to other jurisdictions uh, across the US as well um, on the COVID response. So very excited to be here. Hi, everyone. My name is Simone Carter. Um, I'm currently in Kinshasa in the DRC. Um, I'm an epidemiologist. I've been working in humanitarian response for the last 10 years, um, starting with cholera in Haiti in 2010. Um, for the last two years, I have been in the DRC. I run UNICEF Social Sciences Analytics uh, Research Cell, and I'm also UNICEF's Global Public Health Emergencies Team Focal Point for Integrated Multidisciplinary Outbreak Analytics. So happy to be on the call. Thanks. My first question to the panel is, how can the UN, the international community, or central government most effectively create this facilitating environment to help engender that individual community effort? 
I'd love to hear your thoughts, any anecdotes or experiences you have about why that's so important. It could be times that it's worked well or times that it's not worked well and so on and so forth. Does anyone want to jump in and uh, talk about ways in which they've seen the need for community engagement and local leadership in a response? Uh, I'm, I'm happy to kick it off if uh, nobody else has thoughts. Um, you know, I, I think that, like you said, Sam, we've seen a lot of examples across the world and across this outbreak and other outbreaks where community engagement just isn't done well uh, and is sort of sidelined in to put other things first. Um, and one of the most important things that I think people forget is that a lot of that a lot of the groundwork for that community engagement really has to start before there ever is an outbreak. Um, you know, this is something we see again and again, is that if we're not constantly engaging different communities at different levels, um, and that's both, you know, if you're working in Sierra Leone, and it's the same thing here within the city of Boston. If you're not doing that work, if you don't have those relationships built, then you have to build them while constant while while responding to an emergency, which is incredibly difficult to do. Um, but if you're able to have a lot of that community and voice already in place before you have to actually do the emergency itself, then a lot of that muscle memory is just much easier uh, and much more fluid to transition over. Um, so, for instance, you know, I know one of the things that worked in in Sierra Leone during the Ebola outbreak was that. Uh, they put a lot of effort into setting up the Social Mobilization Action Consortium, which really looked at um, bringing in local leaders and local NGOs that already had existing relationships, that had faith-based community, um, and trying to amplify some of the messages that we're getting across for that. Uh, but even, you know, setting up that took some time, and it, it took a lot of relationship building. Um, here in Boston for the COVID response, same thing happened, where we were trying to get on the ground information at the start of COVID, um, not necessarily about where people were ill, um, but a lot of those secondary effects. So what was happening in our communities was that people were really struggling financially and they weren't able to buy food. Um, so, you know, one of the things that we stepped up and, and tried to do was to build relationships with food banks, to build relationships with faith-based organizations. Uh, and when those hadn't been done beforehand, uh, there was a lot of sort of scrambling and trying to put that together. So if those are able to be built more into sort of a whole approach to a health system and to health system preparedness. That helps us a lot when emergencies and outbreaks actually happen. I mean, I think I think one of the biggest challenges, and it's something that we've fought really hard for um, in the DRC, but also across the continent, is is the importance of engaging with communities on their priorities. I think one of the biggest challenges. Um, about COVID is that we continue to talk about community engagement actually for COVID prevention when we have the what we have been saying is secondary impacts which are actually if you put them on the same scale next to what's happening uh, in communities in terms of access to sexual reproductive health, access to vaccines, access to foods, um, everything that is happening in the continent because of the public health and social measures to stop COVID, we're not actually engaging communities in their priorities. Um, we are really putting our priorities forward and saying engage with these um, and so I think we also need to take a step back when we look at things like um, you know at a UN level when we look at things like global risk communication community engagement strategies are we putting equally community health priorities which might not be COVID um, as as the same importance um, and I think especially when we have to start facing you know information such as we're not seeing the same um, the same impact, the same mortality in in this continent, but we are seeing huge impacts in terms of school closures. Evidence that we we had before before we closed schools, we knew what had happened in Sierra Leone uh, and Liberia and West Africa when we closed schools, but we took that risk anyway. Um, and so, when we look at our decision making in terms of engaging communities with a response that is actually putting them at at greater harm, um, I think we also need to be really mindful about those decisions and what is our role in in bringing forward community voices and community priorities in terms of their own health um, as opposed to only looking at it from a, a, a COVID perspective. I, I think that that's like such an important conversation and it's one that I think that people have tried to edge at but it's a very difficult conversation to address head-on and I, I think that it's um, 
one that I would really encourage, and, and I thank you for that. I mean, I, I do think and agree that, you know, many uh, disease outbreak response measures in particular, and this is not unique to COVID, it's something that we've seen for COVID, it's something we've seen for Ebola in DRC, it's something we've seen for Ebola in West Africa as well. Things like isolation, quarantine, lockdowns, like you say, they they do serve to limit in some ways the spread of a dangerous pathogen, but they can also have some really negative consequences. So um, that might mean uh, increases in things like domestic abuse, um, increases in things uh, as uh, simple but important as poverty as well. Um, so I guess then, uh, you know, this is a very broad question um, for uh, those on the line, um, but how how do we most effectively balance prioritizing those needs? I mean, I think that there's always this tension between um, the sort of top-down uh, response where we have technical experts that are saying this and this needs to be done. And we sometimes hear that what people are struggling with uh, is in some ways caused by those interventions. And at a point, a decision needs to be made about whether or not to privilege or prioritize the sort of point of view of those experts or the point of view of the community. And like, what, what do you do if those things don't agree with one another? Uh, I, I mean, I can throw myself on that one. I don't, I don't have a great answer for it necessarily as a, you know, here's a solution. But I think one of the things that we're seeing here in the U.S. that's analogous to this is actually opening schools. Um, it's hugely contentious. We know it has huge impacts. And to be honest, there's there's no real right answer for us right now um, that makes anybody happy other than there being no virus and schools being completely open and in person. Uh, everything else makes teachers or parents or students all uncomfortable in different ways. And it depends, you know, in terms of a lot of it is it depends on race background. It depends on your economic uh, background and what capacities you have to do remote learning or not do remote learning. It depends if you're rural or, or urban. It depends if you're in a, you know, in a county that has had zero cases for the last three months versus if you're in New York City, uh, you know, and walked through the everything in the spring. Um, and, and I think that it is something that, you know, I know here in the U.S., we have across every single health department you talk to really struggled with because they have really tried to get a lot of community voice in um, because it impacts so much, like I said, in terms of teachers and unions and the students themselves. Um, and in addition to that, also getting, balancing that out with the best public health uh, sort of advice and knowledge that we have that's, you know, constantly evolving as well out there. Um, you know, but at some point somebody does have to make, does have to make a, a decision, uh, you know, and I think that for what I've seen in the jurisdictions that I've been working with is that there, you know, there's, there's not a great metric of how you calculate that out and how you decide who makes that decision, but having that decision be locally driven um, is hugely important as, as trite as that might sound. Uh, having it be locally driven by the local leaders with a lot of that community input. Um, and then being, I think, very honest with the community about the fact that, we understand that there are struggles and that there, you know, that the decisions that are made might impact people and it might make some people angry or upset. Um, but having that type of transparency really allows people to give you better feedback. And, um, you know, in the U.S., I think that we've, we've kind of gotten ourselves stuck into a cycle where we're continuously giving feedback uh, and then updating things. And a lot of school districts haven't, you know, made decisions and it's uh, prolonged things, which is really, it's made things very difficult for both parents and teachers and students as self. Um, and so having that a little bit more finalized and having that feedback mechanism again, a little bit more solidified in advance would be hugely help, helpful. Yeah, I think, I think one of the other um, really important parts is to document and evidence. So we've got lots, we love the epi data on, um, on COVID and how are we getting quality data on the impacts. So we have in the DRC longitudinal study, um, but we have data coming out every six weeks where we work with everything qualitative, quantitative, DIGS2, so health services use data. Um, how are we tracking that and how are we tracking it regularly and how are we using that as an, 
alert system. So schools that are reopening again, are we aware of what the numbers were of attendance beforehand? Are we checking it within the first month, two months, and what are we doing and are we ready financially to respond to that? But I think it requires as well an amount of evidence where we we have a lot of um, anecdotal evidence about, about the secondary impacts, the broader impacts of this very vertical response. Um, and I don't think, I think we need to give a lot more rigor, a lot more energy um, and a lot more space and put them on the same scale of what are the impacts of the, the, the decisions that we're making. Um, but that takes a robustness. So, um, I mean, in the DOC, what we're doing is we're bringing together people who do um, impacts, socioeconomic studies, health studies, uh, health services use and qualitative research and we're putting them together in one single workshop every six weeks to go what's happening um, to try and give it a, a stronger voice but I think that I think that evidence base is really important but not waiting until we're two years later like we did in West Africa to say what's the impact of school closures um, yes my name is Marcela Scuntar Rodriguez um, and I currently work in the ERC uh, for Mercy Corps. I'm the strategic coordination advisor. Um, and I started in almost the very beginning of the Ebola response uh, in DRC. Um, this is actually my first experience in public health uh, in DRC. And then, well, I worked with uh, Mercy Corps until, I mean, I, I, I worked in, with the Ebola response until the end. And then I started um, contributing to the other programs in the adaptation um, to to the COVID prevention. So so yeah, that's that's uh, what I've been doing, and I continue supporting the program um, in uh, COVID nineteen prevention. Thanks so much, Marcella, and uh, to those on the line, Marcella has just uh, wrapped up about twenty four hours of. Uh, travel and overnight flying. So um, a huge thanks for her joining us this evening. Um, so I did want to swing back, Simona, and pick up on the train of thought that we just had about the role of um, social science and research. I mean, I, I fundamentally agree with you that it's something that we need. We need to have uh, not only the engagement of local actors, but also the data for decision makers and also for uh, uh, individuals at the sort of quote unquote community level to be able to make their own decisions. And that, you know, coming in one or two years after the mark uh, to generate that information means a, a huge amount of lost time. And in the context of a health emergency or a disease outbreak, lost time can very much mean human lives. And so I guess um, uh, I'll start by turning this question to you, Simone, but also to uh, the others on the panel. I mean, what what do you think uh, was the reason why the need for social science and that kind of social data was not prioritized in the first place, or at least why wasn't it there at the beginning? And what can we do moving forward to make sure that we do have access to that kind of data and that kind of information for future health emergencies? What, what went wrong and what can we do better in the future? I think we're getting, you know, starting from the West African Ebola outbreak, we are giving more and more space um, to social sciences. We've been uh, very successful in having this social sciences analytics cell in the DRC. We sit next to epidemiologists. We do not sit in the risk communication teams. We sit with the epidemiologists. We sit with the people who run the DHS too, so the um, health services use data analysts as well, and we sit under the Ministry of Health. And I think that those factors are critical. Um, I think for social behavioral sciences to be heard at the same level, it has to be sitting at the same level, um, but also with the Ministry of Health if you if you have a functional Minister of Health or a partially functional Minister of Health. Um, that's, that's also critical. Um, and, and everything being done in support. I think globally, though, um, we still look at a disease as a medical problem and not a behavioral problem. We still look at an outbreak um, as, as something that you're sick with and not something that how you got it, how to stop it, that absolutely everything is behavioral. I mean, it's, we, made, we made the joke here a lot that a surveillance form, we take epi data and they're filled in by surveillance forms, which is filled in by a human being, which at the end of the day is, is a behavioral 
uh, intervention. And yet, the way we analyze it, we've decided that this is this is gold data, you know. Um, and so, I think we really need to have those conversations at very high levels um, as well. So, when we when we look at response strategies, that social sciences isn't an afterthought; it should actually be the the driving thought because it is a behavioral thing. Outbreaks are are exactly that, um, and that takes a huge amount of advocacy. Um, also, demonstrating so we have had a lot of success at uh, the GORN operation calls, for example, of putting together epidemiological updates and social behavioral sciences updates, looking at them side by side. Um, it takes also, I mean, in the long run, it will take training people in the same field together, um, sending teams out that work that way with governments. Um, but in, in the short term, I think it does take a lot of looking at a strategy that is um, human-based, human-centered, um, and advocating for that. Um, but again, the more we show the evidence of not paying attention to the data, what happens, um, hopefully the greater voice it will get. Erin or Marcella, I think Angus has lost his connection. Do you have anything to contribute about the need for, um, like, how do, we, how do we understand what communities need? How do we really get a grip for that local level information and data that allows us to um, make responses to health emergencies, which affect whole countries, whole regions at the same time? How do we make them locally specific? How do we get that information effectively? Uh, I don't know if Marcella wants to, to jump in here, but I, I will say, and there's something that we that we did during the beginning of COVID was actually to do surveys. Uh, and surveys are obviously in no way perfect, and they're quite biased, and it depends on, you know, a whole host of factors. Um, but that was one of the things for us that, that did work really well. And also, I think, you know, for me, at least the difference between Ebola response in Sierra Leone and COVID response, obviously, in Boston is you're looking at two dramatically different contexts in terms of what your resources are um, and what you're what you're sitting on. So, you know, I, I did Sierra Leone response there working with the Ministry of Health and working with the universities there and um, everything that, uh, you know, in terms of all those responses. Uh, and then came to Boston where, you know, my office is within a one mile radius of six level one trauma hospitals and some of the best universities in the world. So anytime we needed feedback from, you know, anybody on what's the best way to do qualitative analysis, not only did we have our own research and evaluation office within the health commission, but, you know, we could call somebody up at Brigham and Women's or call somebody from Harvard or something like that. Uh, you know, so having those access to those type of partnerships is, you know, quite different for us, or at least it was quite different for me. Um, but that being said, you know, geography is one thing. And I, I think that there's a lot of places that, you know, the, there's a lot of ways that those those relationships can obviously be built up uh, in advance, such as LSHDM and, and others uh, who are able to have footprints and have support in locations and try to build that capacity in advance or rapidly at the start of uh, an outbreak to try to support some of that that needs assessment and really understanding what those community needs are. Yes, uh, hi. No, I just wanted to add that um, I think, again, we, we come back again to the same point that uh, in public emergencies, uh, it's very hard. Like, it, it has been very hard with uh, the West Africa and also the DRC outbreak and other uh, outbreaks to include community from the beginning. Uh, so we have a hard time to apply this lesson learned, but uh, but still, like it's something that we need to do since the beginning in the planning um, phase. And we don't have much time to plan because we are we get immediately in the response mode. So, but definitely like analyzing the context and, and there, it, of course, the social science uh, work is just essential uh, having the anthropologists work with the teams from the beginning to understand the local context. Like that, that's basic, uh, and that's where I think uh, failed in the beginning of the response and in the first months. Um, in our in our case, well, from the NGO uh, point of view, where we started to do is uh, working uh, with the local based organizations, like community based organizations, in the beginning. So. Uh, local leaders, young leader leaders, uh, etc. Et because we knew that they were uh, that we could get a sense of what the community 
was fearing or what why they were mistrusting the, the response uh, in such a difficult moment in terms of politics too. So, I mean, that, that as an entry point, uh, it, it sounds obvious, <laughs> but but it, it, if it wasn't done, uh, I believe, in the, in the proper way since the beginning. So, yeah, I just wanted to add that. Um, yeah, no, Marcella, um, I, I really um, appreciate your feedback and uh, your insights as well. Um, in addition to Aaron's and Simone's, I guess um, maybe one thing uh, coming back to you, uh, Marcella, but uh, Simone, I know you had experience in this context as well. Um, you know, in, in the context, for example, looking back to the Eastern DRC, uh, the Kivu Ebola response, um, you know, Marcella, what, what do you think would have allowed for these voices to have been more, um, to have been listened to more. You said that, you know, Mercy Corps in the Goma area and the DRC area was able to engage these youth groups and these civil society groups, but that they weren't listened to enough. Um, who was not listening to them enough and why? Yeah, um, I mean, happy to. I think over the, and this, this also answers, I think, uh, Michaela's question about uh, what, you know, community engagement was really raised in, in West Africa as well, um, for those of us who were there. And he, from September 2018, it was still an issue in Eastern DRC. I think there's a couple of really clear reasons. Um, one is that we do not invest in community engagement the same way we invest in the biomedical components of an outbreak response. Um, we Afterward, we invest in setting up quality healthcare centers. Well, we don't always, but we attempt to set up uh, or have sustainable impact on healthcare services, et cetera. We have some form of exit strategy. Um, and in, you know, I was in Benny in September 2018. It wasn't that no community was engaged. It was that they were still engaged based on our priorities. And we still have an approach that we hire armies to sensitize people. It's 2020. I mean, we have to... We have to stop hiring that way, training people for half an hour and expecting them to go out and pass messages. And when we look at informing communities, great, fantastic. But when we look at engaging communities, that's not how you do it. And people can't answer. We don't, we don't invest in community engagement and capacity or skill to dialogue. We, we get people who are physicians, expert trained in doing all kinds of biomedical response. And you know, when it comes to community engagement, basically anybody, anybody can do it kind of approach. Um, and so we have a real, a real lack of skill there. And when it comes to talking and, and pushing the fact that people should be trained on how to dialogue and answer questions, a bowl is complicated. COVID's even more complicated in terms of our ability to answer community questions. If you don't have people who are, who are skilled in that, instead we, we think community engagement is accept what we want you to do versus let me answer your questions and let us dialogue on this. And that really requires investment of skilled um, people and I think at a, at a UN level, we have a huge responsibility in the same way we send surveillance teams or biomedical teams that we're spending really skilled people in community engagement to train um, local counterparts. So one of the things we argued for and we're still arguing for is that we would have, if you have, there was 14,000 people in the Eastern DRC outbreak. So how do you make sure that everybody is able to answer community engagements if they're working in the response? What is the mechanism to ensure systematic training and retraining so people have enough information to correctly answer things like a vaccine trial, um, treatment which is experimental, all of these kinds of things that make people really uncomfortable because they're complicated. Um, we need to put in the, the, the mechanisms to work with local organizations. And I think another point that is absolutely critical, if I can, is that if you put in 81% of men in a response, you will not have an effective engagement of communities because the people that you are hiring are not representative communities. We have to correctly hire uh, women and national and local counterparts. Yeah, so regarding the community engagement, one thing that uh, we found very, very fruitful was um, working with locals because like uh, we've been working in vaccine trials here in Sierra Leone. So one thing that really promoted community engagement and acceptance was when we use the locals because the people believe in themselves. They know that um, when they work with themselves, they trust themselves better. So that will help them to accept whatever intervention we are bringing to them. 
So looking, going back to, um, because I saw a question about how we can empower locals. So it's really very important for us to really empower local people to take up ownership of their systems and also work towards um, fighting or controlling pandemics. Because like now, just like what uh, Jidan is saying, all the borders are closed. People are now focused on their own uh, country. So it means that we need to push the local um, capacity building at the forefront. So that will really help us to um, to benefit and that will help us to control outbreaks at the national level. Then going back to the um, role of um, social science in, in pandemics, you know, one problem that led to it being not being too um, taken much serious was people always think that um, we do we do what, what they call a slow science because they believe that before you go to the community to do like ethnography, for instance, it will take you years to understand a community before you come back to maybe with, with your research findings. But now we've shown that um, it can be a rapid um, research alongside uh, uh, epidemiologists. Because like what we've been doing in Sierra Leone was we go in the field, listen to community concerns, we bring those back during our daily planning so people can know what the communities are saying. Then they can also bring those community concerns on board when they want to, for instance, send people to go and engage the community. They will know now what the community is saying and how they will uh, react to what the community thinks and what the community concerns are. And all these things have been very effective working here. So it's important for us to listen to the community, take their concerns on board, and also plan with them. Because one thing I believe in is um, we can't, when we, want to, um, when we want to work for the community, we need to plan with them. Because if we plan with them, they will know that they are also part of the, of the system. Because once there is that disconnect between the, the, the responders and the community, that will bring problems. But if they see us working with them from the very beginning, I think that we, they all will, will understand that this problem is um, is something that is affecting all of us. So all of us need to come in to solve the problems. So it's important for us to take these things into cognizance. Yeah, that, that's so true, uh, Angus. Um, and you know, I love this idea that um, even just finding the right phrase and the right terminology to talk about these issues as you know the response and the community is already problematic because it means that we're separating those two things. We're not understanding them as one and the same. And I think that your point is really, really sage. Is a really good point that. Um, in some contexts, uh, we have seen in the recent past with disease outbreaks like Ebola, we have the um, you know sudden intervention of the UN and what we call the international community. Uh, but when it comes to a true pandemic like COVID, there is still some of that resource, that sort of traditional system and uh, architecture of disease outbreak response, where people fly in from around the world to try and respond. But uh, you know, one of the ways that, one of the things that I think COVID has made really clear to your point is that we need to empower uh, communities, we need to empower and capacitate local actors to have the skills, the knowledge uh, to respond to problems in their own areas, in their own countries, in their own communities, because they can't necessarily rely on the availability of that architecture to come in and respond. So. I really appreciate that perspective. I think it's a really good point. And uh, thank you. I know you're bouncing around uh, trying to get a good internet connection to join. So I really appreciate your efforts to come back on the line. Um, does anyone else have any following thoughts on uh, Angus's comments or shall I move on to the next question? I'll give it a few seconds to see if someone wants to take off their mic and say something. Dame Sally uh, spoke a lot about the need for not only clinicians and epidemiologists, this is something Simone brought up, um, but uh, also people from a range of disciplines, people from a range of sectors to be involved in the uh, preparedness and response. Um, we also talked some about the um, need for uh, community level understanding and the engagement of communities. And one quick question I did want to ask, because to me it feels like an elephant in the room, is that a lot of people might think that this is just an issue of funding. This is just an issue of money. Uh, that it's just because we don't have the necessary resources to engage everyone effectively at all times. And I'm going to put you a little bit on the spot, Aaron, as the individual calling in um, from the United States. 
from uh, one of the wealthier and, and uh, more sort of resourced areas of the country. I know that these are issues that have been um, we've been facing here in the UK. I'm sure that some of these things resonate in the United States, in Massachusetts as well. Um, how do you understand uh how to navigate this area, knowing that the resources are there, but these are still things that we struggle with, that it's not just an issue of money. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that actually, to be honest, I, I saw better community engagement in uh, West Africa and East Africa when I was working there than I have in Boston, um, because I think that there's, there's so much there's so many resources and so so much investment has already been done sort of at a government level and a health systems level that it's it's a strong enough system to then carry on the community and there's a lot of trust in those existing systems um so not as much has been led at a community level and that's not to say it hasn't been done at all um but there is a lot more discussion happening about community resilience and to your point it's it's not something that's incredibly expensive i think that for a lot of folks, though, it's something that's sort of secondary um, to where the priorities have been. And, and part of that is not necessarily funding related, that there's not enough funding, but it's that, at least in the U.S., we've had a public health preparedness system that is very, it's been very top down and mostly led in a post 9-11 world to really support what happens if there's an anthrax attack or if our hospitals have to deal with a mass shooting or something like that. Uh, so it really has just focused, you know, in terms of deliverables on that level, on sort of that health systems level and a little bit at the government level. And there just hasn't been as much to push it at the community level. So it's not necessarily that the resources are there. I think that the, it's sort of seen much more as just a lower priority overall. And I, I do think that that is changing. Um, I, I, I know that it's changing in Boston. I know it's changing in a lot of other jurisdictions as well. But, you know, I don't think that we are to the place that we want it to be. Um, and I think that if those systems had been as strong as they are in a lot of other places that I've worked, uh, you know, COVID would have been a very different response. Thanks, Aaron. I think that's a really sage uh, response. So we just have a few minutes left and I want to save at least one just for a quick wrap up at the end. So um, going over to some of the questions that have been coming in from the audience. Um, Jillian uh, from London asked that COVID has highlighted that a rapid response to outbreaks must happen via local and national organizations, as we've been talking about, especially when borders close and flights are canceled, yet rarely national organizations are empowered and funded to prepare and to respond. So if and when it does come to issues of actual you know, budget lines, funding and cash flow, how can we push uh, central governments, how can we push the UN, how can we push the World Health Organization to put their money where their mouth is, and when they say that there's a need for community engagement, actually make sure that it's funded. I mean, I think this also uh, answers or leads to the question, the second question, Michaela, that you had asked about. Um, I know I've lost it. Sorry. Um, on the decolonization of of global health, and I think that there's, I, I don't think that there's an interest. I don't think that we have enough of an actual. Um, interest and dedication to to give the money to the local organizations to reinforce uh, capacity. Um, I mean, I think it's been it's having been in the DRC for Ebola, where there was fourteen thousand res responders, having been here for COVID and the next uh, the current Ebola outbreak. Um, it's been nice to have less people being allowed in the country, <laughs> um, but it's it's. I think that we are not that interested, to be completely honest. I think as international actors, I think as the UN, um, we need to be a lot more uh, honest about our our relationship with local partners um, and local counterparts and what um, what capacity building really looks like, um, what, uh, yeah, what reinforcing that really looks like. And I don't think that we take it seriously. Um, we, we did write about... Um, it was published via SHAP with colleagues from IDS on the broader um, impacts of a vertical response and the concepts of who is vulnerable and who decides who's vulnerable and who decides how we work correctly with communities. And I do think that that's an important concept of, it still is a very Western response. It is it is led by Geneva um, or or the states. It is it is based on our priorities of, of um, 
of uh, health. And so I think I think that we are not not there at all. So our topic of non-communicable diseases is a very broad one, obviously, and I think it will be interesting just to draw parallels, really, to start off with drawing parallels between non-communicable diseases and obviously the, the pandemic and transmissible diseases like the virus, um, like coronavirus. Um, just also something to remember, which we, we will touch on towards the end, is that um, we're going to try and work towards some action points at every level, as they mentioned in the introductory talks. Um, and also to remember that all our discussions will probably, they will be underpinned by the overarching themes of diversity, education and human rights as well. And so I think the best way to start is probably turning towards the panel just to ask if you're happy to introduce yourselves just to give us an overview, introduce yourselves just to give us an overview um, of you all as individuals. Um, do you mind starting, Margot, if I turn to you, if you don't mind telling us a bit about yourself? So, my name is Margot Turner, and for 18 years I worked with diverse communities in London in social care, and some of them in, in health and social care. And then after 18 years, I was asked to bring that experience into medical education, and I'm now Senior Lecturer in Diversity and Medical Education at St George's University of London. Thank you very much. Um, and Andre, do you mind just introducing yourself as well? Not at all. So my name is Andrei Martin Vujkovac. I'm from Slovenia. Uh, today I'm representing the International Youth Health Organization. By education, I'm a medical doctor. However, I've worked in NGOs ever since my graduation. Um, the organization I'm representing today uh, works with and for young people, mostly trying to prevent non-communicable diseases by addressing the main risk factors such as tobacco use, alcohol consumption, nutrition, physical activities, and, and also others. So our, uh, let's say, modus operandi is uh, to empower young people across Europe to engage in preventive project research and advocacy work um, to create better environments for themselves and also for other children, adolescents and youth. Um, and today I'm hoping to bring some insight uh, from this very dynamic and colorful sector, uh, maybe sharing a more layman's or a youth perspective on some, uh, some of the causes of NCDs. Um, in addition to that, I'm also serving as part of the leadership of the Adolescent and Youth Constituency within the, the Partnership for Maternal, Newborn, Child and Adolescent Health that works under the WHO. Excellent, thank you. And thank you both for being here. Um, if we do manage to get a, a couple of other panel members, then we can introduce them as we go through. Um, we may also have um, a rapporteur joining us. Um, as well to summarise our main points back in the main room. So I think to start off with then, as we mentioned in the introductions, the overarching um, theme of how we can draw a parallel really between non-communicable diseases and, and also between the, the global pandemic of, of a virus and something that is communicable as well. Um, I wondered whether from your insights, whether you have seen any parallels either in the management of these two very different types of diseases that we're looking at, or whether there are lessons that we can learn from the pandemic and, and take back to non-communicable management as well. Um, Margot, do you mind starting with any insight? Then? I suppose I'm, I'm not a medic, hmm. but the obvious parallel that I see is the inequalities. In hmm. So the inequalities in terms of that we're now seeing the same uh, communities that are infected affected by um, non-communicable diseases, affected by COVID. And so that this is our chance, a bit like we were, was being said before, to change those inequalities. And therefore, I would see that as, as the focus. And as Andre was saying, he's talking about that in, in the focus of, of youth. And I'm thinking about that more in terms of what we can do to change um, our, our future medics, but also to think about how we can work effectively with patients in order to kind of maybe change healthcare behaviours, but include them, include them in terms of, of healthcare and and changing lives in order to affect change. Hmm. Yes, thank you. I, 
that that theme of healthcare inequality is is a huge one. Obviously, it's always been a problem, and I think the the context of the pandemic has really shed a light on on it in more, in more stark. You know, it's more obvious to see. So I think that's definitely something that we we can touch on and revisit in more detail. Yes, definitely. Actually, I would like to point out one parallel, one similarity that I see, and also one contrast. So what I think we can learn from from dealing with pandemics. And I'll start with the first one. Um, I do think that both worlds, both challenges that we're facing, we cannot only um, attribute it to to saving it to the med- healthcare or the medical profession. I think it has to come. Um, it has to be in touch with all the people that it touches in return. Um, and we must go beyond our sector to reach out to the other people. And I think that's something that we're doing today very brilliantly. Yeah. Um, but it's such, both both worlds touch on other issues, such not only physical health, but social bonds, economics. And I do believe that all these sectors need to come together in solving, solving these very complex challenges. Um, now, the contrast that I've noticed um, and it's not the first time that happens, and it's something that we can, for, I think for NCDs, we can learn from um, from pandemics like the COVID, is I, I do believe that NCDs suffer a little bit from a curse of urgency um, because NCDs, by its nature, take time to develop, and they've been around for years, and they've sort of, I, I believe, slowly crept up on us. They don't get the attention that is needed um, to address them properly. While we have other diseases such as COVID or maybe Ebola in the past or other issues such as climate change, for example, which are important issues. I'm not saying that they're not, but they're very sensational and they take all the attention. And I think that's something um, that we need to learn from the sector. Maybe when this pandemic or this sensation that's around the pandemic is over to, to carry out that urgency also in addressing NCDs because they are a huge issue Let's not forget that most people in the world today die because of NCDs. Um, and, and yeah, as, and it needs to be treated as such as well. Yeah, thank you. That's a really useful insight. And that phrase, the curse of urgency, is a very useful one, actually. So, yeah, it's a very useful insight. Um, so I think drawing on that in that case, there's obviously a lot to be done. Um, I think this idea of healthcare inequality is a good place to, to continue, Margot. Um, obviously, it's the pandemic shone a light on it. What, how can we begin to to address this? How can we begin to tackle such a huge issue? Um, well, I think one way is is maybe through the the kind of language of, of health and illness. Mm-hmm. And certainly, um, what I've worked on recently was working in, in partnership with a medical student who came to me and said, as the first black. Uh, student in his family to come to, to, med, to medical school, he found that when he was being taught clinical skills, there was no reference to black and brown skins and signs and symptoms on black and brown skins. And this to me was incredible as a, as a, as a patient and not as a doctor, that, we, that we, this has not been included in the language. And then we can't understand why people then won't think about healthcare change or won't accept um, healthcare in the same way as we will, but if we're not including them in our language, and it's not only about medical schools and, and other, this the booklet that we created has now been accepted by the London Ambulance Brigade because they want to, to see change in, in recognition of, of everybody. Um, but, but also our language, our language is all about kind of being pale, that means you're ill, but that, that then has no relevance at all to somebody with black and brown skins. So I think this is an opportunity for us to look at our language and to be more equal in terms of delivery of health care. Hmm. Yes, thank you. Um, and actually you can see, well, I can see parallels. Andre, you mentioned the, the, um, the context of the pandemic and the almost as the frenzy really of something that's so urgent and you can see how that plays into the language that's used to describe healthcare situations and therefore the the response that we can have so I think looking at the language you use and and making sure that it's inclusive and covering all 
um, and diverse in its approach from right from educating our healthcare professionals is really important. Um, is this something from your position in Slovenia, Andrea, is this something that you have come across or that you're aware of at all in um, looking at the language of healthcare in, in education? Uh, definitely. I, I would even, I would say the language of health among the people, maybe. I, I came into a little bit of a, almost a culture shock when I, when I came out of medical school mm. and I started working with youth who don't necessarily have to do anything with healthcare. They are, you know, students or just young people that are interested in these topics. And um, what we've learned is that we really, the language is theirs because health belongs to people, not to healthcare workers or healthcare providers. And that needs to be reflected in the way we, we approach people. Um, using their words, using how they interpret health, and then also the interpretations of health might become different. Um, referring back to what I said, you know, is my culture shock, I realized that healthcare, the way I was brought up as a doctor, is disease care, it's not healthcare. Yeah. And health promotion has a much wider vocabulary that doesn't include all the Latin words that we've learned in, in med school. And I think those are the ones that need to be used. Um, and then onward, I would maybe also point out the, the language that we use in the context of the pandemic and other health, health emergencies is, I do believe, or, or we do see that right now, the language that is being used might have detrimental effects also to, to the population because the certain words that are being used such as crisis, uh, people on the front lines, people, uh, you know, that this is a fight, makes people feel like we're in a crisis, that we're fighting something. And in a way we are, um, but it creates more stress. Whereas I do think that if we choose our words more carefully, uh, focusing on solidarity, focusing on um, us working together, um, it, it might have maybe not even a better result, but a better quality of life until we get to that result. Yeah, and that's why I think that we, following on from what Andre was saying, that's why I think that we need to change medical education. And when I came into medical education 18 years ago, it was still about disease. And now many more accepting that we need to have patients as partners, we need to have social care organisations as partners. I worked in, with youth before I came into medical education and I think having people as equal partners so coming in to be involved in creating um, medical education, also being able to have our medical schools as being almost like community venues. So we mm -hmm. run, I've worked with the students to run uh, discos for people with intellectual disabilities, to have um, uh, to create new environments. So lots of medical schools in the UK have just got white men, statues of white men. And actually, what we've done is to celebrate the contribution of the Windrush generation. Um, and when those exhibitions were going up, I saw patients, people that worked in the hospital, coming to take pictures because suddenly there they were. We need to create those inclusive environments in education and in mm. may, may I comment on that actually also? Yeah. Um, because uh, I, I recently finished medical school two years ago, um, and I do see uh, a shift maybe from, let's say, decades ago. It was a, the, the result of medical education, I believe, in a lot of cases resulted in, to, in separating the doctors in their own vocabulary and the language that they used from the rest of the population. But I do see a shift towards the, the other way right now. And also I was um, say privileged enough that I did have training within my med medical education on how to communicate with the patient, what kind of words to use and so on. And I do see more and more being invested into that. Um, and definitely I, that, that is the right way to go. It's about creating the community and the collaboration between the patient and the doctor or healthcare professionals, not the divide. Yeah. Mm. But lots of times medical schools are saying to me, for instance, that they don't have, they don't have a diverse community. And actually mm. COVID is a chance. So like where we are speaking now, we have a chance to, by 
so they work with patients with sickle cell to come in and talk virtually to students. And I think originally my medical school said, oh no, it's far too difficult, we can't possibly do that. Mm. And yes, it's difficult, but we need to do it. And really, really important. And other medical schools actually can reach out to more diverse communities. If they haven't got them there, they can now come in from all over the world. So I think that's what's a real opportunity in a way of, of us, of this learning opportunity. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I think it's very useful to hear practical examples of how this looks, you know, of hearing practical examples of actually logistically how that gap between education and the community and its rich surrounding has been addressed in, in places where you've worked, Marvis, so that's very useful. Um, we took, we've touched on language and you mentioned some virtual initiatives as well. And I think that's an interesting point, particularly with the pandemic. Um, we've seen a lot, a lot of use of the digital era, a lot of um, online um, sources for people's health education and a lot of people are getting their knowledge from online. Um, I just wondered if either, and we've talked about healthcare as opposed to disease care. I wondered if any of you have any observations on um, how the digital side of our communication has affected, you know, our health behaviours now that we're all spending more time online, if that makes sense. Mm, I think for patients, what I know about some patient groups, particularly those that are isolated, mm. there are more myths that are coming, sort of health myths that are coming across the internet. Um, mm. And I know originally at the beginning of COVID, there was there was something that went around that said that black people weren't going to be affected by COVID, is the original myth. Now I've heard lots of people saying that they're worried about the fact that any um, vaccine that might be developed might be experimented on, um, on communities, particularly black communities. And, and, and of course, I know from our colonial history that, that I know where that comes from. And, and often we as white people don't recognise that and we don't see that, which is why it's important that Black Lives Matter has shown us that we need to look at that history and understand that history in order to create a more, more equity and more equality in terms of healthcare. So we understand by where all those different healthcare messages may be coming from and not judge people as a result. Mm. Yes, yeah, thank you. And I think this all serves this all feeds into the fact that, you know, any country being in a lockdown is a very complex social setup and it affects how we communicate, but mm. also how we um, live our day to day lives and health behaviours such as smoking and alcohol as well. Um, Andre, do you think that the context of a lockdown has, do you think that's had any particular influences on our health care behaviours and how people are reacting to lockdown? Oh, yeah. Definitely, and there is already research to 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 support it with evidence. Uh, however, interestingly enough, it's very difficult to generalize what that effect was mm -hmm. because it's had different effects over different social groups, different countries, different age groups, even, and different health behaviors. Um, for example, let's take alcohol consumption. Um, some people's mental health was severely affected by the pandemic. And they sought refuge in addictive behaviors such as drinking more alcohol, while some people stopped drinking as much because uh, there was a lack of social interaction. And that's usually the context in which they used to consume alcohol. Um, so, yes, it is very difficult to draw a line. And I think uh, after the pandemic, it will be easier to pull all those um, studies together and see what was the total sum. Um, however, one thing is clear, and that's that drinking and smoking and other addictive behaviors have not, have not stopped. Um, and I also don't think that's a coincidence. Uh, maybe more on that uh, a bit later, um, if we will also be talking about the role of alcohol or smoking as risk factors in a bit of a wider context. Hmm. Mm. Thank you. Yes, it does. It, I mean, it does lead well to thinking of these behaviours as risk factors um, because yeah they are risk factors for a lot of the non-communicable diseases that we see a lot of and um, so do you have any extra thoughts on on how they act as risk factors Andre? 
Yes, uh, I mean, <laughs> I sort of gave myself this, uh, this transition to the next question anyway. Um, I, in the context of the pandemic, um, I do believe that, you know, in a time when the whole world or whole countries went into lockdown into survival mode, focusing on the essentials, we have these goods, which are definitely not essentials to survive, and they've remained. Um, despite, you know, clearly not being only risk factors for NCDs, but some of them also for COVID, um, such as smoking very clearly, and also alcohol. I mean, it also has a, a big role in infectious diseases. Um, and I think it shows how strongly these are ingrained in our environments. Um, and I don't, I, I don't think that's an accident. There are certain some commercial factors behind at play, and it seems that despite the pandemic, they're still very strong. Um, and that is, to me and to the community that I serve, is quite frightening. Mm. Yeah. Um, Margot, just trying to see how we can add an extra layer of the medical education, the role in these risk factors and healthcare behaviours. It sometimes it's as simple as healthcare professionals, you know, mentioning and educating their patients about the risks of smoking, for example. But do you think that medical education can play more of a role in in promoting healthcare behaviours and inclusion amongst Yeah, them? I think one of the things is that actually what we need to think about hmm. is those are stereotypes that that met that that um, patients may have of of doctors. Mm -hmm and also stereotypes that doctors may have of their patients. Mm. And that's one of the things that I think every medical school needs to be thinking about in order for medics to become effective advocates for their patients. So certainly when I ask students what um, stereotypes they think patients will have of them, they say, oh, the people will think they're posh, that they're remote, that works. So they've already thought mm -hmm. that people actually might not actually reach out to them. The other interesting thing is that when we, when we test medics who are through verbal examinations, they, they then find it really difficult to ask groups such as, for, for instance, homeless, if you do a homeless person, they then think, oh, I'm going to be stereotyping them if I, they ask them about drugs or alcohol. But we know that that really affects that group of people. So you need to be asking. So we need to be looking at training people to ask people in a non-judgmental way so people understand why people are asking, why people are asking in order to help them. We also need to be linking. If I was a community link worker in a GP surgery, and I think that we had fantastic opportunities in the 80s and 90s when we were having more kind of community health initiatives in the way that Andre was talking about before. It's not just about health, it's got to be about whole system and to be more flexible and more responsive in a whole variety of ways in order to address those complex needs. Thank you. And just touching on those community health initiatives that were more prevalent, why where why do you think that they feature less in today's world than, than they did in the eighties and nineties? I, well, no, I think in the 80s and 90s, I was what was called a community link worker in the mm. surgery. So I could link all sorts of community services to people that, that, that the medics might not have time to do. Mm. I thought that might take off, but I, I think got lack of funding. I think there were still odd bits of, um, I heard about an initiative in Froome in Somerset, where all the, the the practices to join together and join together with health and social service, social services, community service, patient groups in order to affect change. And I think in, in terms of us thinking about what we would recommend, I think that we need to be recommending much more of a kind of community, social and healthcare approach in order to affect change. Hmm. Thank you. So this, this is interesting because it does, as you say, feed into what recommendations we might conclude on. Um, and also, you've touched on what I think is quite interesting about the community level, is that it's, it's not so big that it's completely inflexible. So it offers a level of flexibility to local need that we can't necessarily get on a national level. But equally, it's bigger than the individual. So it's 
a got more money behind it but it's it's large enough to take into account the bigger picture as well um so it's quite a unique level of action and i think that's that will help us kind of decide at these different levels what we might recommend as well um i think this this discussion that we've had about language and stereotypes um and the way in which we view certain things is very interesting and recently in the uk in particular they're trying to make a move to making in the context of the pandemic to making mask wearing be seen as almost an anti-social thing to do and at, not wearing a mask to be seen as an anti-social behavior in the same way that some healthcare health behaviors are seen do you think that andre starting with you do you think this is a a successful strategy do you think that that sort of social shift and the shift of language will be powerful enough in in changing people's perceptions of disease definitely norms have a role to play in, in health behavior uh, we can see that also in in other contexts in risk factors uh, for ncds so yes i would say yes in a way but we also need to be careful because uh, some approaches um, let's say marking certain behaviors as antisocial um, it's very close and it's a very slippery slope to becoming judgmental and to 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 go down that way that path and that's not the way we want to go definitely not because it's not effective and it's not ethical either um, especially as as health professionals um, but also as a i think as a more general population we want to live in a world where we are supporting each other um, not judging each other even even if we don't agree with how certain people act or uh, some of their behaviors so um yeah I, I think it's a yes and no um i would say let's make wearing a mask a norm rather than not making not wearing a mask of antisocial behavior mm -hmm. hmm. um what i think is really interesting is that in my medical school um women that wore niqab and covered their faces were considered to be a security risk um, and also that I was advised that teaching medical students not to shake hands with people um, and greet people in a, in a culturally sensitive way, either by touching their heart, was also considered very odd. And what I think is very interesting is six months later, all of us are covering our faces and there is no security problem. So I think we have to think about how these message, messages have changed why it is communities might not trust us because funnily enough six months ago we didn't trust them um and and look what we could learn now from them um and 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 admit to learning from them rather yeah. than it being something that we've just discovered which yeah. is often what happens within uh somewhere where the kind of white heteronormative norm is is always the way hmm. Yes, the admission of learning from others is is the next step, isn't it? It's not something that you necessarily get to see, really. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we have uh, 15 more minutes of this particular breakout group, which I think is a good time for us to start to try and work on our um, action points, um, which we've touched on. And I, I, I mean, there are so many that we could end up concluding on, really. But um, if we start perhaps by looking at the individual level, because that seems to be where our discussion started, having talked about healthcare behavior, health behaviors. Um, is there anything that springs to mind um, in terms of action points for the individual and what we might be able to promote or recommend from our breakout group? Shall we start with Margot to give your... So I suppose for me, where I've made the most change has been in partnerships. Hmm. Is it either in partnership with patients or in partnership with students in order to affect change? So I think if people make individual partnerships in order to affect change, that for me would be a very powerful message. Yes, thank you. Um, and you gave examples um, of the DISCO and you mentioned the gardening initiatives as well. So you, have you got examples of different partnerships? So then? we'll mind the gap, which I did with a, a second year yeah. medical student. Yeah. Um, partnerships I've done with community, I've been working with sickle cell patients, 
um, and and they become educators. Um, the gardening project I did a long time ago that was working with young offenders in order to work with older population. Okay. Um, and it was something that people thought would never work, but older people told younger people um, horror stories about the war, and they loved it. <laughs> yeah. And and they didn't, didn't nick anything from their homes, which is what everybody thought they'd do. Um, and, and these two groups of people met together, and they mm. hate one another, and they loved one another. They thought it was great. Mm. But I think we need to be more imaginative about our partnerships, both yeah. as individuals and as, and as groups. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, Andre, do you have any thoughts about the individual level and what we can do at an individual level? Um, yes, first I would like to reiterate the point that was made now uh, in terms of partnership, not only being maybe imaginative, but also being open-minded. I think especially as, as I mentioned almost, well, as I mentioned earlier, healthcare professionals, maybe doctors more so than others, tend, tend to feel like they have more of a say when it comes to health and they're not so open to listening to other stakeholders when it comes to health or health promotion. Um, at least that's, that's the experience from the spaces where I've been working in. Um, and I think with that open-mindedness of, of those individuals in particular, um, these partnerships will be possible and I'm, pretty sh and I'm quite sure that would flourish into, into great results. Um, when talking about NCDs and the individual's, let's say, contribution to it, we cannot go past healthy behaviors um, because it's up to every individual to practice them. However, I really feel that it's very, very important to, to reiterate that people do not, it's not only up to the individuals to execute those healthy behaviors. Um, the environments also need to allow that. It needs to be appropriate for their social and cultural context. Um, and it's way too easy to blame people for unhealthy behaviors. And we don't do enough looking at the underlying factors for why people are not behaving in a healthy manner. Um, so in a way, yes, it's up to the individuals, but far from only being up to the individuals. Hmm. Thank you. And so with that in mind and talking about the environment in which the individual is operating, um, what can we do at a community level? What, how can the environment facilitate healthy behaviours? Um, I would say it's about what Andre was talking about, about right from the start, which is about combining health and social care mm -hmm. the community to provide a more flexible whole care approach in order to help people affect healthy changes within the community. So it's that combined health and social care, I think, is the drive within communities. Yeah. Andre, do you have any thoughts on that? Yes, definitely. Uh, I think one um, was already made earlier with the partnerships. I sort of also think that the partnerships really do belong in the community and different stakeholders coming together. Um, one additional point that I would like to mention is also really looking at the physical space that's around us and to make sure that the way it was organized promotes the most healthy possible behavior. And that, you know, we can talk about food and what kind of food is available to us and in what quantities um, to facilities for physical activity, to, I don't know, bike lanes. And those are very specific and sometimes very infrastructural things that we can think of and they need to be organized on a community level if we want people to behave in certain ways that we want them to. It's a, it's a necessary prerequisite. Hmm. Um, yeah, that's, that's really useful. I'm just trying to think of any examples of, you know, of the infrastructure helping the individual to, to lead healthy behaviors. Which I can't think of at the top of my head, but it is that. I think, I think the bike lanes is a really bike good idea. Yeah. We didn't have bike lanes where mm. I live um, before COVID. We now have bike really? lanes. Yeah. So, and my son, who always was the one that, well, along with me, who's scared of cars, but um, was never going to ride a bike, is now riding a bike. He wasn't going to be doing it before COVID. Mm -hmm. 
it is. I, I, I also, yeah, I also agree with that. That it's a perfect example. Even in this case, in the time of COVID, even if roads didn't change, the physical infrastructure didn't change. But because there weren't so many cars on the roads, people deemed the roads to be safe enough. And maybe going back to some cities that are famous for cycling, such as Copenhagen, for example, yeah. they didn't build bike lanes because people are already cycling. People started cycling because they built a bike lane. Mm -hmm. um, or another example could be uh, thinking about the food we feed our children at school lunches, for example, in cafeterias. Some countries have policies that mandate the schools to provide, to provide meals. Um, but then it's up to the schools or the community to decide what they're going to feed them. Um, and if we complain that the children don't eat healthy enough, let's look at what they're being fed off in the schools because what will be on offer there, the kids will eat in the end. But if they have a choice or if the only choice is something unhealthy, then that's what it's going to be. Yeah. Yes, that's great. Um, we have a comment in from um, an attendee from B, also mentioning the couch to 5K as that's an NHS initiative, so a national initiative, um, as a simple digital way to encourage healthy behaviour. Yeah. Um, also, you mentioning school meals has been a topical issue here in the UK, Andrea, as well, um, with campaigns to encourage healthy and free school meals to a lot of children during the pandemic who wouldn't have otherwise had access to healthy food. Um, so there are so many examples, actually, and, and they've crossed the boundary, really, between the community and the national levels. Um, but they do affect and encourage these healthy behaviours at the individual level as well. Um, so moving up nationally then, it seems as though a lot of the initiatives that are successful are those which kind of empower as many individuals as possible to, to act, practice healthy behaviours. Um, so we've talked a bit about um, infrastructure, um, we've talked about education, I'm sure legislation comes into it as well and and can play into healthy behaviours. Do you have any other thoughts on a national level, what we might be able to recommend to, to continue to promote this, these behaviours? I suppose on a national level, it's for um, our government to stop dividing communities. Um, and effectively, that's what it feels like at the moment, mm. dividing communities, particularly where communities um, have got more inequalities. Um, and and so you you see people saying, well, this doesn't affect us, so we're not. Whereas, was what we need is a much more joined up approach to affect change for healthy behaviours for all. Um, not just it's okay where we are, so we don't care about you, which seems to be feels to me like what our national agenda is at the moment. Hmm. Andre, do you have any um, observations from a Slovenian perspective in terms of? Healthcare provision on a national level is that mm. are you seeing similar issues as us in the UK? Um, yes, definitely, I do think so. Um, even though I would like to speak about something else, um, mm. where we see and also a, a big part of our work in our organisation is ensuring certain policies to be put in place on a national level that ensure healthy environments for for young people and mostly have to do with. Um, tobacco policies and alcohol policies, mm -hmm. uh, tobacco and alcohol control policies, obviously, in this case. Um, and there are very specific policies um, to be put in place that affect raising the prices, limiting the availability of these products, and <clears throat> also limiting the marketing of these products. Um, as we know, they are marketed and targeted to children, to young people specifically, even though in a lot of cases, that's uh, selling these products to them is not allowed. Um, and those are the policies that really show that are very cost effective. Um, so that's something that I don't think I could go out of this um, session without making that very clear. <laughs> yeah. Definitely, good point. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, and now on a wider scale then, on the international level, um, so looking at, at organizations such as the UN or the World Health Organization, what could we suggest um, at a higher level that might be able to promote what we've discussed within communities? Um, I think it's what you were saying, Ibiya, that we find really difficult, which is that learning from others. Hmm. I can remember when I was first in medical education and working to set up 
like primary care group to students. And a Ghanaian doctor said, all our medical students learn in the community. We don't learn in class hospitals and we don't learn in this. And so, and it's like, so why didn't we learn from, from countries in Africa? And that's actually because the West doesn't learn from people in Africa or people in India or people from other countries, other countries who they have subjugated in the past. And um, I think we, need, we don't see people in uh, medical education conferences that come from countries that aren't Western countries that can afford to come there. Uh, so I think we need to address that and we need to learn from others globally. And again, these are opportunities because it doesn't cost you to, to be dialing in um, from all over the world and therefore we should be doing that mm. and, uh, on a global perspective and learning from one another. Thank you. That does remind me, Margot, of something you mentioned, decolonizing the medical curriculum. Is this the sort yeah. of thing that you meant that you um, include in that sort in that statement? Or? Yes. So I think so much of medical education has been, you know, when we looked at our curriculum, we saw that all the doctors were white, they had white names, we needed to have a variety of healthcare professionals that represented people and our students and our community across the world. Um, we also had to not have stereotypes, which we have a lot of in our curriculum, and, and whole communities weren't represented. So I've worked with students in order and patients in order to create a more representative um, uh, curriculum, um, because we've just left them out of the board. Mm. Thank you. Andrew, do you have any thoughts on an international level? What might yeah, our recommendations be? Um, yeah, I, I do think that uh, international level is becoming inevitable in our work. Um, as we know, globalization is happening and we might as well take the best of it. Um, and it, ha it plays a role in so many different levels from exchange of good practices to validation of uh, different, uh, let's say, measures that are being taken in one country or another. Um, to maybe international standardization or setting minimal standards for certain things or procedures, um, to international leadership, as we've heard previously, or for organizations such as the WHO to take leadership in these, in these times, even as, as the one we're living in now. Um, yes, and, and then also we cannot ignore that some, some issues, some challenges that we're facing are of an international na nature, and they do not reside only in one particular country or in one particular locality. Um, spreading of viruses being one of them, but then also um, controlling, I don't know, digital marketing of unhealthy products to children, which can span over borders, and an international solution is needed for it. So I definitely see that uh, an international level plays a role, multiple roles. However, we always had, uh, when I was in the uh, International Federation of Medical Student Associations, we had the, the um, slogan, think global, act local. I think these international measures always need to be thought of as what kind of impact they're going to have locally. Um, uh, yes, thank you. Um, there's a couple of questions in the chat. I think we just have about three minutes more. And somebody's asked, what can be done to encourage people with NCDs to present to their doctors on time during a pandemic when people are fearful of going to their doctors? That's a very good question. Um, I think part of it might tie into access and accessibility of healthcare. And we talked a bit about the technical, the digital side and what we might be able to do to encourage people to present. But I think it also might feed into access in terms of reaching all um, demographic groups and reaching all healthcare groups in a community. Margot, I think this feeds into um, health in healthcare inequalities and promoting equality. So I think if you're working in, if, 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 if primary care is working in conjunction, say, with patient groups, and then there's, or there's a, or there's a kind of a triage system, almost if you if you have any doubts please contact this person so that they they won't feel they're taking up the doctor's time or that mm -hmm. we can think of imaginative ways 
I think, of encouraging people to, um, to, to, because I'm, I have, um, Addison's myself, so I'm supported at the moment by Addison's, uh, support group mm -hmm. and by the Endocrinology Society. Because actually, I don't tick any boxes when it comes to kind of COVID warnings. Right. Um, so I have to find other places to get help. And that's where I think we need to promote those, the other places to get help. Yes, yeah, thank you. Andrea, do you have anything to add on finding your doctors in a family? Yeah, well, I think it, it's difficult to answer this question because it heavily, re um, it heavily relates to the context of each individual and also of each community and access to healthcare that is available there. I know that in some countries, and this changes week to week or day to day even, um, some healthcare facilities are literally shutting down for anything but COVID. Um, and in those cases, yes, it is very difficult to, to, to get access to a doctor. However, people who made that decision um, or put it into place probably have the reason for it. Now, this I know that what I said is very it's quite controversial, um, and but it's it's playing back into again to what I said in the beginning of this of this uh, panel where people weren't here yet. This is the curse of urgency, and from what Margot was saying, I, I do agree that we need to be imaginative, we need to be inventive into finding other support systems because in times like these, it's difficult. To rely on the system that we're used to relying on. Hmm. Thank you very much. I think we could continue, I know, and I'm sorry that we had to start a little bit later, so we've had even less time for discussion, and there are other questions, but it is time to return to the main stage now. And um, thank you, Tricia. You put a link on the live chat on the side of your screen, so we should be able to follow that link and reconvene on the main stage. But just thank you very much to the panel, and thank you for your really useful insights. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, and welcome to this Universal Access to Healthcare Digital Health Group. I'm afraid you guys won't be able to see me, but hopefully you can hear me. Um, I am so delighted to be able to introduce this topic. It's such an important topic right now for the future of global health and for the future of how we deal with with pandemics. I was asked to reflect a little bit based on my experience in WHO for the last eight months of working on COVID. What were some of the things that we've learned that was so important? And some of these things David Nabarro and Sally Davis talked about in their introductions. For me in WHO, there are four main things that we've learned during COVID. The first is that COVID has really driven home to us the importance of public health, the importance of testing, of contract tracing, of quarantining, of creating surveillance systems and data collection systems, the importance of providing health information to the public on the pandemic at the right time in language that they understand, one of the basic tenets of public health. The second thing that has been driven home in this pandemic is the importance of social determinants. And social determinants are the background, the things that are so important when we think about global health, where people live what their socioeconomic status is, how they work, how they interact with the world. And what we've learned during COVID is that social determinants, these underlying issues, such as poverty, such as housing, have had such an effect on both the likelihood of people to get COVID, as well as the outcomes um, when they get COVID. The third thing that we've realized in WHO is the importance of universal health care. And as I mentioned in the introduction, universal health care is about getting people quality and affordable services 
when they need them. And what we've seen with COVID is that if people get sick, they need quick access to good quality and affordable treatment and services. This has been a lesson driven home from all of the countries that we work with. And finally, the lesson that we've learned is the importance of digital. Now, digital we've seen during the pandemic, we've seen a massive increase in use, both on the public information side and the prevention side with digital programs, apps, digital messaging, going out to the public to explain about keeping themselves healthy and to advise them on the outbreak. And we've also seen a massive increase in digital for services, particularly telemedicine, as services have been disrupted and governments and individuals have looked towards digital to provide a link to the health systems. It's my real pleasure to now introduce Jay Himmelstein from the University of Massachusetts. And Jay is going to talk to us in more detail about these four findings. And he's going to talk about his experience within the United States. Over to you, Jay. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, by brief background, I'm a physician and a public health specialist. I'm a professor of population and quantitative health sciences at the University of Massachusetts Medical School. And I'm delighted to uh, be here to talk about a little bit of the overview uh, about the response to the pandemic across different countries. And I've been asked to sort of focus on uh, helping to explain uh, what has worked and not worked uh, in the United States. Um, you should be seeing a slide that says, what have you learned so far, Gina, is that right? Um, so, this is just restating, I guess uh, you've already covered these points, but uh, you know, I'll just restate it because it's worth restating. Public health measures have been the key to preventing the spread and protecting populations. I know this, the title of this is Universal Access to Healthcare, but as, as you'll hear from other speakers, um, even those countries with very poor or underfunded healthcare systems um, can do well in fighting the epidemic by using basic public health uh, measures. Um, and, uh, and one of the interesting things, both uh, across countries, but within the United States, is how different approaches to coordination between the public and healthcare delivery systems um, can either be uh, uh, factors for success or factors for dismal failure. Um, one of the other interesting things is, regardless of whether you have universal health care or not, um, whether you have a national health system that's privately or publicly funded or an incomplete system like in the United States, social and income related social health still make a big difference. So that regardless of what kind of public, general public health tracing you do or what kind of health care you offer, um, if we don't address basic social determinants, there's going to continue to be disparities in health outcomes, including and especially mortality rates. And as Gina said, telehealth has made a difference. It's interesting, it'll be interesting to hear how it plays out differently in different countries and intersections with different health delivery systems. So there was some interest in hearing about uh, some of the effect in the US response to COVID. Many people, including my are shocked at how poorly uh, the United States responded. Uh, and it has exposed a number of problems in our public healthcare systems. Um, in the United States, our system is predominantly uh, run at the state and level. It does get some funding from the federal government and the Centers for Disease Control, but it's really up to each state to manage their public health systems. And in general, these systems are underfunded. The United States does not have universal health coverage. I think this is pretty well known as defined by the WHO despite the fact we spend far more on health care than any country. For example, we spend twice as much as uh, uh, England uh, and France, uh, and, uh, but yet we still have more than 30 million people in this country who do not have access uh, to insurance coverage. It is important to note, however, that coverage varies remarkably from state to state, ranging from Texas, which has 18% uninsured, to Massachusetts, with only 3% uninsured. 
And as you'll see in the next slide, this reflects other factors that uh, impact uh, ability to respond. And the biggest issue, no doubt, is that the current federal administration has shirked responsibility, not taken any responsibility for coordinating response um, and supporting public health efforts. And this has been a major factor in the United States response. So I have this one slide, there could be many others to illustrate this, but I think many people outside of the US have heard about uh, so-called Obamacare, which is the Affordable Care Act, which was passed in 2009. A key component of that, uh, of, of, of Obamacare, a key component to achieve universal coverage was the expansion of the Medicaid program, which is our program for folks who don't have insurance in any other way, aren't being offered by their um, uh, by their employer, um, aren't eligible for Medicare. They're, they're younger folks who are working folks, um, and the Medicaid expansion was going to be the way to get to universal health care. But many states, some of them large states like Florida and Texas, chose not to expand their Medicaid program. It was a national law that was dependent on state implementation. So this has left major parts of the country with inadequate insurance, and we're seeing the differences in outcomes as a result of that. So how has, given this polyglot, uh, this, this kind of way that we're structured, how has the U.S. fared? Well, the public health response and health system readiness varies greatly by states. Um, here in Massachusetts, where we have relatively low in, uh, uninsurance, had a very aggressive response, we actually dealt pretty well with the initial surge, even though they, we were one of the first two states to get hit hard. Um, uh, that said, the lack of coordination between states has contributed to rolling surges and excess COVID spread, disease and mortality. And we're seeing that now uh, some of the early states like New York and Massachusetts have gotten their, their uh, spread significant under control, but now uh, with interstate travel, and other states not taking similar public health um, measures. We have other states having their own flames of, of COVID spread, and then once again, transmitting that back and forth between the states. So we, unlike some states in, in uh, some countries in Europe, have never gotten our, um, our baseline prevalence down to a manageable level. And we're, we're dealing with not, uh, mo not, not a uh, second uh, um, wave, but actually multiple waves happening concurrently. That said, we did have some good lessons in the United States. There was very rapid uptake of telehealth and other, other digital technologies, and they proved helpful. Uh, uh, they were initiated primarily to decrease the strain on the health systems and to avoid unnecessary exposures to COVID uh, by health providers and people in the community. But uh, it's also been found that, you know, as we'll hear more from other speakers, that uh, the digital technologies can be very effective ways of providing uh, efficient care, especially for uh, in, in the areas of mental health and for low income folks who might have trouble getting safely to healthcare appointments. It can be not a replacement for universal health care, but it can be an accessory that can be very productive. And similar other countries, social terms of health have contributed to significant racial and ethnic disparities in COVID outcomes. As I mentioned, and as Gina mentioned, this is true everywhere, but it is worse because you have people in the United States who, because of lack of health insurance, and that means 30, over 30 million people, are very reluctant to go to see a doctor if they're not sure they actually need it, and it may delay them getting to see a doctor, or they may show up in the hospital for a very advanced case and, and, uh, and have a poor outcome as a result. So that's similar to um, other countries, but it's worsened by our inadequate access and the costs and the fear of costs related to healthcare. Finally, I'll just, just quickly, you know, what I was asked to talk about what's next for the US. Uh, my sense is on the positive side that public health, scientific and healthcare communities are prepared to make progress on the prevention of spread. We know what we need to do. There's many new treatments that are coming out and uh, likely to be effective, especially uh, monoclonal antibodies. Uh, and there are a number of promising vaccines that may be successful in addressing COVID in the long term. But our success is ultimately going to depend on a national commitment and leadership. It's too 
difficult, challenging to have 50 states going in 50 different ways, competing for resources with different data systems and different uh, degrees of commitment to public health. It's very challenging. So we're going to have an election uh, in just a few weeks, and that I think will have a big impact on determining our readiness and response to the next phase of the pandemic here, as well as our ability to participate and potentially contribute to the United Nations and WHO efforts, including vaccine development and uh, distribution. So um, thank you once again for the opportunity. I look forward to uh, listening to other panelists and joining in the discussion. Thanks, Jay. That was fantastic. Great overview of these fundamental, uh, I would say, building blocks that we've learned in WHO and reflecting for the U.S. the relevance for, for your country. Really excellent. I'm aware that we've lost a panel member, and I believe that the, the tech team is trying to, to get her back. Um, but in the interest of time, I think we should push ahead. Um, so the, the first discussion that we're going to, to have, and I would invite audience members to also take part in this discussion, is a discussion around UHC, universal healthcare, and digital. And I'm going to ask each of the panel members to share their experiences of digital and UHC during this pandemic. And if audience members would like to share their experiences in the chat, we could also try to reflect back on those as well. So why don't I start off by asking Sifu Yile to give us a little bit of background on his telemedicine work in Kenya and to talk to us a little bit about the UHC programs in Kenya and what he's learned during the pandemic about both UHC and digital. Sifayele. All right, thank you, Jeannie. A very good evening to everyone. <clears throat> and also just a point of correction, I'm in South Africa, not Kenya. Uh, so I'm in the South Saharan region. Uh, but um, yeah, thank you very much for that. I think it's, it's quite important to, to start off from uh, what Jay had mentioned earlier on, just around universal um, healthcare and, and, and also just the link between the two with digital technology and technology in general, specifically telemedicine. So the pillars of telemedicine um, are essentially what we're trying to do is, you know, um, make healthcare accessible, make healthcare affordable, um, and and also giving quality healthcare at the same time. So that that's the kind of work that we've been looking around in terms of how to to lower the the the, the, the cost of accessing healthcare, specifically in South Africa and also for a lot of members of the country. Because as we know, um, specifically you know around within the private healthcare space, um, and 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 if you think of the US as well, healthcare is a very expensive service to to to. To, to kind of access. Um, and so we've looked at using uh, telemedicine, um, essentially whether it's telephonic, whether it's, it's mHealth, which is mobile, uh, whether it's virtual video, um, we've managed to, to allow individuals and, and more people access to doctors um, so that they're able to, to get consultations as they need. So what we've noted in, in the past couple of months months in COVID because COVID for us came a bit later and I'm sure it did in many countries at different times. Uh, our first case was in March in South Africa. Um, and what we found is that specifically people would less likely go to a hospital, less likely go to their general practitioners, so they'd rather stay home. That's the first thing that we saw. So we looked at ways in which we could give people access to the same quality healthcare but also more affordable healthcare at the same time. And so we launched our telemedicine program where we had doctors, you know, consulting with various people and something that's easily accessible with internet connection or even just a telephone line. Um, and that's what we did. However, what we found was unlike the USA or more developed countries, we had very poor uptake of telehealth care in general. Um, and we found the reasons to be one, adoption um, as, as a factor, but also the, the second factor that's quite important, and um, you know, a lot of people that stay in developing countries can attest to this, um, accessing the internet 
for a lot of South Africans is something that's very difficult. For mobile telephones to start off with, is not something that a lot of people have within the country. So where to make means and make sure that you know it's it's less virtual video consultations because there's no stable internet connection at times that people can't access. Um, I mean, I stay specifically in a, in a more metropolitan area, so I've got fiber internet, um, and it's 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 I, I find it easily accessible, so I can go on the internet and you know do a video consultation. However, a lot of people, whether they're from rural areas or other townships, cannot access it as easily as I can. Um, so what we also found was that a lot of telephonic calls were being made in terms of telemedicine um, consultations, and 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 that's what we saw. So the uptake was not as huge as as we thought it was going to be, it was actually very low. So around 5% uptake generally within the country um, in, in terms of telehealth care. So, so, so really, I think the essence um, of telemedicine and how it links to universal health care um, is, is that it's trying to make health care as affordable as possible and as accessible as possible. And, that, and that's, I think, what we're trying to achieve in, in, in terms of um, doing telehealth care in general. The other thing that I found, and uh, specifically the research that I did when I was at uh, Brits University, was looking at the use of social media in behavioral change, which is what we then ended up doing specifically with the pandemic like this. So how do you control fake news? How do we control the, you know, the, the provision of information to people to, to, to make sure that during this time of COVID, you need to wear a mask, um, we need to social distance, and how do you provide that information? I think that was done thoroughly well, specifically within the government, but also as individuals. Um, I know myself, I, I started hosting uh, what we call COVID conversations, where I had conversations with different doctors within the healthcare fraternity to kind of find out, essentially, if a mother is pregnant, how does COVID affect that mother? But specifically doing it with experts within the field. And I realized that the more you, you use people that are accredited, uh, that people can trust, the more information you get across, and the more people will likely change their behavior because they trust the individual delivering it. So in a nutshell, that's my experience with COVID in South Africa in the past couple of months. Thank you so much. That's fantastic experience and very much food for thought for us, particularly on the, around this issue of uptake of telehealth and telemedicine. Um, and the great and uh, the great work on using digital as well to get behavior change messaging out and health information out. I would invite the audience uh, to use the chat option. There is a live chat option for this session. So if you have questions for our panelists or if you'd like to share your experiences of UHC and digital, please use the chat option. I'm now going to turn to Orsi. Uh, to pick up on this issue of using digital for behavior change. Wasi is a researcher at the University of Cranfield and has a particular interest in mobile phone digital for digital health-based programs for health promotion and health prevention. Wasi, what has been your experience in the countries you work with or in the UK of UHC and digital during the pandemic? Thank you, Ginny. Uh, thank you very much. Um, yes, um, I think um, what I've experienced in the last six, seven months, it, it was phenomenal because um, uh, um, COVID-19 happened to, to right in the middle of, uh, of my research, really, when I was looking at um, digital technology and then how digital can actually support and um, uh, help prevention work in Sudan, Senegal and India. And we all know about the technology, and then we all talk that the importance of, of, of digital technology and the access to information. But what I found the most interesting is not just only the direct effect of digital, which was about improving the infrastructure locally, building a local technical capacity um, in, in Sudan and Senegal, but the so-called spillover effect that digital really created um, and then how um, an erased technical capacity um, and a platform that has been put in place um, to uh, look for prevention and then to, to support prevention around non-communicable diseases were able to create an instant opportunity 
for raising awareness around um, COVID itself. And um, in both cases in, in Sudan and Senegal, it opened up a dialogue between the private and, 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 uh, and public sector and created opportunities for not only the technology to be put in place, but a new ecosystem to emerge that, um, that digital was, was the catalyst to start this process of, um, specifically in, in, in Sudan, where as a respond to COVID-19 um, um, uh, and using this platform, there was a conversation with WhatsApp Business um, to actually say, how can we create new consultation services during the pandemics? Uh, how can we reach out to people? How can we actually help people and still continue our work um, and offer them um, uh, healthcare through, um, um, through, through the platform itself? And that was a beautiful example of how quickly the private and public sector started to work uh, together to create a new service model. And um, so as in, in Senegal, um, the whole concept of digital opened up a new dialogue between each sectors and, and created the opportunity for, um, for new opportunities uh, to arise as a, um, as, a, as, a, as a result of that. And, and I think what we will hear later on, it's really that looking at technology, not only for sale anymore, but really technology for use and really putting prevention at the upfront um, of, of healthcare and then saying, how can prevention be really um, beneficial to, um, to overall fight cases such as um, uh, the um, pandemic or, or like a COVID-19 as well. And, and from experience working with Senegal and Sudan, this the, the call of digital not only created an effect in this case, but it, on, it was all, also uh, the case in the rise of Ebola in the very beginning of Senegal when they took on a digital uh, platform when the messages were quickly changed um, to start to raise awareness around um, the Ebola outbreak. And it's significantly, uh, from experience we know and from the numbers and measurements, that it significantly uh, decreased the cases of uh, Ebola in Senegal. And this is the perfect opportunity for us to say what role really digital plays in prevention and put digital in the upfront of prevention um, in, uh, in countries, um, in developing countries and developed countries as well. Brilliant. Thanks, Marcy. Fantastic reminder for us all that digital can be used for prevention and health promotion. We've got a fantastic comment in the chat, and it's something that many of us working on digital do question. And the comment is around whether or not digital should be seen as a separate standalone fix to universal health care or whether it should be seen as part of universal health care. Um, the, the, the comment is from Rhiannon, and I'm going to ask Abin Bola, actually, to talk to us about the, the fantastic work that she's doing in Nigeria around providing digital pharmacies and digital services that are very much part of the, the health system within Nigeria and are not seen as a separate standalone service. And perhaps you can weave in um, the comment from Rhiannon. Over to you, Mbimbola. Thank you very much, Jenny. So what we see is that universal healthcare covers five key areas. Um, the promotive, preventive, curative, rehabilitative, and palliative aspects of healthcare. And digital actually complements all of the brick and mortar and everything you have in place for healthcare systems to thrive. It's not a standalone, it's a complementary part, and it enhances and catalyzes healthcare delivery at all levels of universal healthcare. We've seen in the work we do at Advantage Health Africa, for example, where we, we closed the last mile gap when medical doctors during COVID were able to consult using tele tele-platforms, video, telephone, and um, mobile, we found that they needed medicines delivered at homes and in offices to the people they had consulted with. 
What we've done in Advantage Health Africa is to create an ecosystem where we have the largest group of pharmacies across the country. And so we're able to raise demand and have them fulfilled all across the country using mobile platforms and simple messaging platforms. So you see universal healthcare is therefore enhanced by the availability of these digital innovative methods, both low tech and high tech. We're also seeing that we're able to collaborate with um, government. Um, two, uh, two weeks ago, I was on a boat ride to a remote area in Lagos. Lagos is the commercial center for the commercial capital of Nigeria. Yet we have those hard to reach areas with, you know, you have to go on a boat ride for about an hour and a half to reach them. We got to, you know, a, a more like an urban village, so to speak, with 10,000 residents, with no primary healthcare facility in place. What you do with such, such places is to complement the work that you find using mobile devices, messaging, and fulfillment using new technologies and new logistic systems. This is how we can bridge the gap. The reality on ground is that we simply do not have enough brick and mortar. We simply do not have enough of the professionals. In Nigeria, we have a population of about 200 million people. And ideally, we should have at least 200,000 pharmacies. The reality is that we have less than 5,000 licensed pharmacies. Therefore, digital is actually the way to leapfrog and to bridge a gap. And I see this all across Africa, that we're bridging the gap of, um, of availability of professionals or facilities themselves using tech um, technology so that it works side by side. One is not replacing the other. One is actually complementing the other and getting us as effective as we can to reach many more people that wouldn't have been captured. We have people that were scared, they were really scared to go to farms and to clinics and hospitals during COVID and during the lockdown. Yet they had chronic illnesses, non-communicable diseases that still needed attention and they still needed medicines. What we are doing at Advantage Health Africa is to reach them and make sure medicines, genuine affordable medicines, get to them. And even those that were, you know, uh, that had symptoms and needed to self-isolate, we got medicines across to them. These are the things that you do and you begin to achieve now with technology and digital healthcare. We could talk some more about what we're doing in preventive and promotive, but we're finding that providing graphical um, methods to communicate with people tends to send the message clearer than simply print and um, text. And what we do with that is to ensure that they, they carry out the preventive measures to avoid you know, getting ill, to avoid spreading the, the virus, and to make sure that they do not panic in a time when there's a lot of panic in the lab. I think that um, going back to, to the comment from Rihanna, I think that digital actually complements what we have on ground in brick and mortar rather than replaces it and no one can be confused about the, the benefits of it. Thank you so much for telling us your experience in, in Nigeria. Very thought-provoking. I'm going to invite again the audience to Put your questions in the chat and also to share your experiences or your organization's experiences of UHC and digital. And I'm going to invite Jay um, to share with us any additional thoughts um, on this question of UHC and digital from the US perspective. Anything you'd like to add? Uh, I, I say a couple. A couple things. I, I think I, I did mention the fact that we have a peculiar situation in, in the United States. I mean, the good news is that um, we saw dramatic uh, uptake of digital health technologies, even and including our poorer populations. Um, I think uh, the comments from South Africa notwithstanding, we have a lot of problems and inequalities and in access to the internet. Uh, but as part of the emergency uh, uh, rules, uh, state Medicaid programs in particular, were allowed to relax the ways in which telemedicine services could normally be delivered. Typically in the United States, they have to be done on a secure platform. 
uh, that requires a fair amount of internet uh, broadband and uh, security. But during the, uh, during the epidemic, we've been allowed to uh, offer simple telephone consultations. And there's no question this has been a great uh, boon uh, for uh, lower income populations, uh, substance, people with substance use disorders, mental health uh, issues, uh, both as a safety thing. And actually, the, the number of the compliance with, out, with showing up for visits has gone up dramatically as a result. Um, but I just want to reiterate, this is not a substitute for regular health care. It's a mitigating factor um, in general. That said, I think using those platforms once they build, we haven't done much of that in the United States because there's not a business model for it. But using it as a more effective way of getting out public health directions, public health guidance, I think is a very, very promising um, issue. One of the things I do wonder about, I know, Gina, we have to make the turn pretty soon to talking about what more can we do, what more can the WHO do, and I'd be interested in how other folks think about that. Is there more, you know, is, is, can we learn from the experiences in South Africa or, um, or uh, Nigeria or other countries who don't have very vigorous, um, well-funded health care systems? Can we learn from their experience and make those platforms more widely available to other countries who don't yet have uh, universal health care access. I'd be interested in others' comments on that. Fantastic, Jay. Thanks. I'm just looking through the chat because I think we've got some audience comments and questions, um, but I'm also aware that time is ticking. So what I'm going to do is just looking through these questions and if the panelists could look through them. The first question is around telemedicine as an alternative for UHC. And telemedicine shouldn't be seen as a simple and quick solution to solving everything. I think the panelists would agree with that. Um, there is a quite a comment in there about countries with less developed infrastructure whether or not health promotion and prevention is a better way in for digital health than to focus on care. What a fantastic question that is, because that actually comes back to the original um, learnings that we gave to this panel and the, the key learning that what this pandemic underpinned was the importance of public health, health promotion, and health prevention. And we heard from Orsi about some of her experiences in countries around using digital for health promotion and health and health and public health, and how that may actually be a quicker entry point for many low income countries. I think that's a really great comment and a great question. I don't know also if you want to add to that. Um, yes, it was it's really something that caught my attention, and, and I think uh, that's really nice to resonate with Abimbola's um, experience as well. Um, I think, and and what we experienced through, with, I looked into Senegal, Sudan, and India, but then we um, through uh, we had to be mobile as one of uh, um, uh, the digital platform that we looked at. There are other countries as well that I managed to have a little peek view in, and. Um, and answering to that question, um, it is, I believe, that um, it is the digital is an opportunity to open up a dialogue between the public and private sector and bring in private sector as, um, as sort of not just the private sector, but um, give them opportunity to support, which they do. And in, in the case of, of Senegal, suddenly you saw uh, this beautiful example where all of the mobile companies are joint forces and then they all came together uh, in order to support one cause and and that just changed the dynamic the power dynamics of the old ways of how we look at partnership um and on the uh, on, on on a second note is the 
the empowerment of patient groups and associations and civil society, uh, because I do believe that digital do have as well through prevention the opportunity for these organizations to have a voice, to power their voice through, and then to become more of a lead um, in starting conversations. And I think that um, is, is a very important um, case that we need to support too. Okay, would any other panelists like to comment on that? Yes, like, uh, okay. yeah. so, so my comment is around the fact that universal healthcare really needs to focus more on preventing or promotion of good healthcare practices or good practices across across the population. That way we then can maximize or optimize our investment in healthcare. Right now the emphasis is too heavy on curative and the curative led really comes in when we've done a poor job of preventing diseases and promoting good, good, good care. If we spend more or invest more all across in promotion and prevention, using digital means, social media, all sorts of new media, and using more of the influencers and the networkers that are available. I think we would have better outcomes at the end of the day. And what we spend on curative will be much more, you know, dollar, you get more returns for the investment in, in per person. So really digital, you know, health technologies will then be promoting the more important aspects of healthcare that I think we've neglected in, in universal healthcare. We have also for too long, um, you know, rewarded the curative leg. We have for too long rewarded um, physicians for treating ill patients. And we have not put in place the right incentives for prevention and promotion. We do not quite quantify the impact that they have, especially in areas like, like where I reside. And I think that if we're going to be you know, keen on universal healthcare, these are the things that WHO, the UN and so on, must place emphasis on and find how to enhance the work of those who are working in promotion and preventing using digital technology. And, and just that one comment is that we had earlier as well. It's really a, to, a call to government to invest more into prevention. And uh, and this is from the examples and the cases that I looked at. The communication broke down when it was approached, uh, when civil society approached government, uh, when they approached the public sector, the private sector, um, mm -hmm. the collaboration just flourished straight away. So there's... I think there is a call overall that um, to the governments that they need to really reconsider prevention being a key. And with that, you've nicely moved us on to the last topic and we've got 10 minutes to address the question about how do we move forward? And we've been particularly asked to think about what do we recommend for governments? What do we recommend for the UN? And what do we recommend for digital, for, sorry, for the, the general public? So based on this fantastic discussion, some of the questions, some of the principles that we started off in the discussion, um, uh, Abin Bola and Orsi have already moved us into the, to the recommendations with a call that governments should focus on prevention and promotion and find incentives and use digital in that area. What else can we ask governments to do in relation to UHC digital? Well, Gina, I would just say, I mean, I would be interested in hearing your perspective from the WHO. I know there's been, it'd be worth just uh, while saying what is being done and then what needs to be enhanced. You know, what do you think is working well with the WHO right now and the UN's relationship with WHO? And there's a way of, are there ways of enhancing the effectiveness of that relationship? Or what things do you see as as gaps right now in WHO's response? Um. Yeah, I'm happy to talk about WHO. Um, panelists, are you okay for me to do that? Seems to be okay. So, so WHO in the area of UHC, my Director General, Dr. Tedros, who I'm sure you've all seen on the media, has been calling before COVID and particularly during COVID, for governments all over the world to ramp up UHC. WHO doesn't have a prescribed path to do that. 
we are aware that different governments use different models to ensure UHC, but the foundation should be a primary healthcare foundation and a foundation, as our colleague from South Africa mentioned, on ensuring the services are accessible, even in the most remote regions, are affordable so that individuals do not lose money and are of a high enough quality. So this is what WHO does. We work with the UN, we work with governments, we work with some private companies, with NGOs, in order to, to encourage governments all over the world to take the issue of UHC more seriously. And certainly during COVID, one of the things we've seen is that those UHC systems are not strong enough in many countries to withstand a pandemic like COVID. In the area of digital, WHO is currently preparing normative guidance for governments, particularly around issues like ethics, confidentiality, data sharing, which are some topics that we didn't touch upon today. WHO also supports governments as they look to see which digital technologies would be most appropriate to support the health system. WHO doesn't recommend certain brands, but what we recommend governments to do is look within the health system to see if there are existing services that can be improved or that can be provided in a more quality or more accessible manner through the use of digital. And again, in our digital work, we work with a range of, of NGOs, governments, um, in some cases, the private sector, and of course, our member states. So that's really our focus on, on digital and on UHC. What more can we do? I think that the, the call, the advocacy call for the WHO is really important. Our organizations, um, when we when we talk about these issues, they, they tend to be taken seriously. And if you look at our director general speeches, our website, our social media feeds, they are all focused on UHC and encouraging countries both to deal with the pandemic, but at the same time find ways to strengthen the UHC systems because this will ensure a, 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 a support for future pandemics as well. And maybe on that note, given that we've got two minutes only, I would ask for any final reflections from our panelists on what can individuals do? Well, one, one quick thing, uh, I just wanted to put a, 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 an exclamation point on something you said, but I think it needs to be driven home, is <clears throat> I wonder about, <clears throat> excuse me, UHC's ability to really share best practices. I know here in the States, every school district, for example, is on its own to try and figure out how to effectively bring people safely back to school. And I don't know if that's a problem in other countries, in developing countries, but the kind of planning and testing that needs them, you know, I don't know if WHO has come out with any guidelines for lower income countries about how to manage, um, you know, uh, keeping people in school, keeping people in work safely. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not talking about, you know, universal guidelines at the, at the country level, but at the community level, even at the workplace or school level, to give people a starting point because everybody seems to be struggling at the same time. It's, a, it's again, part of the public health mission, I think. Absolutely. And if um, panelists or the audience want to go to the WHO <laughs> website, there are fantastic resources on the COVID-19 page on topics around school opening, school closure, um, topics that are particularly focused for the interests of the general public, how to stay healthy at home during COVID, how to ensure um, that you are supporting your community and your family during COVID. There's a lot of fantastic resources and all of the resources on the WHO website have of course been informed by best practices and by um, global research. I believe we have to wrap up. So if there are any final questions from our panelists, 
Now is your chance. Happen Bernie, your final word. Uh, my final words, I really, really, really want us to continue to invest in more of the digital technology, like um, diagnostic devices that can be used at primary care level. And um, maybe let's focus on primary care centers and more on primary care services. And so that way you decentralize and you begin to optimize the capacity that is already on ground in pharmacies and laboratories and in clinics. And also essentially we must begin to inter bring them onto a, an ecosystem where there's interoperability. The silos are not working for us. In Nigeria, we need more larger chains and we can't achieve that. But with interoperability, we have a studio chain and we can have better effectiveness at that level. Good evening, and um, I got to the lecture evening. Um, firstly, I would like to introduce our panel members um, who say a little bit about yourselves and introduce yourselves individually. So, um, Victor, can I start first with you, please? Hi, thanks, Ray. Um, my name is Victor Ugo. I am the founder of Mentally Ray Nigeria Initiative, and I work here in London with um, United for Global Mental Health. Uh, my organization in Nigeria has been in existence for the past four years and um, in that time we have grown to become one of the biggest organizations um, supporting youth mental health across Africa and um, one of the biggest services that we provide is um, crisis support. Um, in, in three years we have had more than 25,000 people access these services. Um, right now we are looking towards going into policy advocacy and um, I think the reason for that I'll probably talk about during the panel. Uh, thanks for having me. Thank you so much, Victor, and I look forward to discussing our topics with you. Um, next, could I please um, go to Liv Green? Could you please introduce yourself and say a little bit about you? Thanks, Claire. My name's Liv, or Olivia Green. I'm um, a mental health recovery worker in a community. The unit specialises in those with forensic or risk backgrounds, um, and I'm currently studying for my MSc in child psychology. Thank you so much, Liv, and I really look forward to discussing our topics with you as well. Um, and next, I'd like to introduce um, Lena. Would you please introduce yourself and say a little bit about you? Hi, good evening, good morning, good afternoon. My name is Lena Zamtia. I'm based out of Harare, Zimbabwe, and I'm the Operations and Franchise Director for an interesting intervention dealing with mental health called the Friendship Bench. Um, ours is to primarily create safe spaces and a sense of belonging in communities, looking at embracing mental well-being and improving people's quality of life. Thank you so much. And I'm really looking forward to hearing so much more about the Friendship Bench. So um, this evening, uh, we're going to start off with discussing how accessible are our healthcare services. Um, and... I'd like to start off by just bringing um, a little piece of information to you, um, and then I'm going to discuss this first with Liv, if that's okay. So the COVID-19 outbreak has had a huge impact on our core NHS services. In order to free up enough capacity to deal with the initial peak of the pandemic, the NHS was forced to shut down or significantly reduce many areas of non-COVID care during April, May and June 2020. This combined with fewer patients seeking care during lockdown means that there has been a significant drop in elective procedures, urgent cancer referrals, first cancer treatments and outpatient appointments. Millions of patients living with healthcare problems, including life-threatening conditions such as cancer, have been affected with their treatment postponed or cancelled. And millions of patients will have missed vital opportunities to receive initial assessments and diagnosis for health problems in the first place. This is the hidden impact of the COVID crisis. Patient safety is being severely compromised, not just by the virus itself, but by the knock-on effects of the unprecedented disruption to our NHS services here in the United Kingdom. That being said, at least half a million more people in the UK may experience mental health difficulties as a result of COVID-19 and as forecasted by the Centre for Mental Health. 
Victor, I'll come to you next. Um, how accessible are healthcare services in Nigeria compared to accessing services here in the UK? Thanks, Claire. Um, I mean, it would have been great to hear from um, Leeds' perspective so that the comparison can be very, very um, clear. Um, but I would say that um, there are similar structures on, or ideas in both systems, um, seeing that they operate in cadres and are mostly community based. So, in the case of the Nigerian system, there are even more clearly defined cadres, like we have primary, secondary, and tertiary facilities. And these exist for both private and public offerings um, um, for, for health services. But also, there are also no restrictions as to which you should visit as there is in the UK. Um, but I want to highlight some, uh, a couple of points. Um, I think that when we think about accessibility uh, and so that you know, the comparison can be very, very effective, there are three, three factors I would love to like, you know, look at. So the first is that accessibility is affected by cost and affordability. Um, in Nigeria, to third the population are below or just above the poverty line. And a huge percentage of the third of the population above the poverty line are just one serious or chronic illness away from falling below the poverty line or from getting into poverty. Um, the health insurance doesn't actually cover more than a small section of the population and doesn't provide considerate cover for mental conditions. So the question really is what happens when you can't afford to get optimal treatment and you actually need it? So what happens is that people go for the next best option that they can access, and that's mostly traditional and religious homes. The second point is that accessibility is affected by perception and stigma, as well as educational level attained. Um, in Nigeria, mental stigma is still very much rife, um, which means that most facilities that offer mental services are just as stigmatized. Uh, people will travel miles to, you know, far away from their own homes and their own states of residence to access mental facilities in other states. Why? It's just so that no one recognizes them or sees them going in or out of these facilities. Now, due to the same stigma and uh, something I call the culturalization and spiritualization of mental conditions in Nigeria, a good number will also not seek mental um, treatment in facilities that offer them. Um, because the perception is that if you are seeking those services, you have been possessed um, by a demon and, and a lot of other things, uh, a lot of other myths that we have to deal with. The third point is that accessibility is affected by ability and existing systemic disadvantages like access, like roads that lead to facilities, um, number of facilities, number of well-resourced facilities, and the structural condition of those facilities, as well as human resource capacity. For example, we have one psychiatrist to 800,000 people in Nigeria. Um, so in public health, there are various deg degrees of delays related to this particular point that are determinants of how accessible health services are, and um, from primary um, delay to secondary delay and to tertiary delay. So the takeaway point for me is that health doesn't exist as a singular concept and is affected by various social determinants. If we want to fix access to health services, we have to employ cross-systems thinking. So in short, the short answer to your question to how accessible are healthcare services in Nigeria, as someone has used both services, I would say they could be so much better. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, it's really interesting to see the differentiation um, of how accessible healthcare services are indeed. Thank you so much, Victor. Um, I want to come back to Liv and see if we have a little bit better connection now, if that's okay. Um, so Liv, um, going back to our question, um, I would like to just recap on that. What needs to be done for mental health services to accommodate the increasing demand for mental health support with so many restrictions, funding cuts and staff shortages? Going off of what Victor said, in comparison, our accessibility is incredibly different. Although we have the services, they are so overrun with demand getting to access the services is our problem. Even before COVID, the waiting lists were over a year or so, just to, just to see somebody to have an assessment. What needs to happen is that mental health facilities need to be prioritised. When, like, as you said, when coronavirus hit, mental health wards were, were shut down to be used for COVID patients mm -hmm. and it now needs to be turned that they need to be prioritised and the impact on people's mental health needs to be recognised that this isn't just a physical health pandemic. 
and until that's prioritised, we can't get the funding and investments that we need for our services. Thank you so much, Liv. We got them in the end. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, um, I just wanted to uh, go on to um, a piece of information that I have that I'd like to share, and then um, I'm going to come back to you, Liv. Um, a recent survey commissioned by Young Minds asked 1,008 GP surgeries across the United Kingdom's uh, questions related to their experiences of treating young people um, struggling with their mental health. It was revealed that there is a lack of early mental health support for young people in their communities. 90% of GPs agreed that, there had, that they had seen a rise in the number of young people seeking support for their mental health in the last three years. 8% of GPs agreed that there was good community support for children and young people with mental health problems in their area, while 77% of GPs disagreed. And only 20% agreed that they had received significant training in mental health to respond to young people's mental health problems, while 59% disagreed. Um, sadly, for many children and young people, the support they seek is not always there when they need it the most. Um, and when they need to access that help and support, sadly, that only tends to be available when they reach a mental health crisis. So Liv, how can mental health services provide an effective and consistent early intervention to support young people? I think there are many factors involved in early intervention. Firstly, I think there needs to be collaborative working between GPs, schools, parents, carers. In that way, if the child is presenting a problem at home or at school, there's more support networks, there's more ability to talk about these things, which you wouldn't get otherwise. As well, it's really important that these early interventions are accessible and that they're inviting to young people. Reaching out for help, especially as a young person, is something that's really scary. And if you're not making it inviting and accessible, you're, you're falling at the first hurdle, essentially. I think it's important that these things are community based rather than kind of a hospital because that just adds to the stigma and the fear behind reaching out for help and like you were saying about training I think people need to be trained effectively in the way that we're all on the same page so you're going to get the same answers wherever you go because there's nothing worse than when you're in a confused and scared state of getting confusing answers so if it's going to be early intervention it needs to be accessible it needs to be clear and it needs to be inviting so that the child or the young adult has that stigma and that fear taken away thank you so much Liv, for that it really is um it's interesting to explore these topics um, and highlight the, the possible solutions as well um, i'm going to come to lena next um, Lena, how accessible are healthcare services in Zimbabwe compared to here in the UK? Thank you, Claire. Um, I think just like um, Victor mentioned, with the developing economies, you find that there are disparities in terms of one's ability to access mental health services. Um, that's, you know, streams from peri-urban to urban to rural. And so, you know, distance and, and resources are indeed a huge factor in terms of one's ability to access resources. I mean, if I put it into context with regards to the conversation that we're having today, um, you know, one in four Zimbabweans suffer from depression or anxiety. Um, and in view of that, Zimbabwe does not have adequate platforms to address these issues and support these in individuals because they're about... 12 psychiatrists to a population of about 14 million. And that's about one mental health professional per 1.5 million. So if you look at those numbers, there's, you know, it's a huge gap in terms of, you know, just a disconnect and the deficiencies in terms of one's ability to access, 
you know, medical health as it aligns to mental health uh, resources. And so there definitely is a challenge, you know, and especially now with COVID-19, um, you know, with the aspect in terms of people having to pay to get tested, um, you know, we have a population that is um, informal and is also struggling in terms of the high unemployment um, issues. So we really have a lot of challenges that, um, that were weighted against. Um, but I think just in view of that, in terms of, you know, trying to find an interesting intervention around how to support mental health services. Um, the Friendship Bench was founded by Dixon Shibanda in his bid to really identify a grassroots solution that would enable easy access of mental health services um, to the population and various communities within Zimbabwe. Um, you know, his decision to, you know, to create the Friendship Bench was really anchored in research, um, you know, where Friendship Bench is reimagining the delivery of um, evidence-based evidence mental health care um, and, and really looking to try and support, you know, individuals who can envision a friendship bench within walking distance. So there it lies in this challenge in terms of, you know, access to one's resources by having a bench placed in different communities, but in communities that, you know, people feel comfortable and are part of, makes it easier for them to actually access uh, mental health resources. Um, so in that regard, you know, that was the interesting intervention for a uh, friendship bench, you know, looking at evidence-based but also making it accessible within walking distance for all. Thank you so much, Lena. And I absolutely love the Friendship Bench. So um, well done to everybody involved. What a fantastic incentive. Um, I think we have been joined by Rigerta now. So um, Rigerta, would you just like to introduce yourself? Sorry, I know we had some connection problems. Um, so just introduce yourself and say a little bit about yourself. Uh, moving on, the COVID-19 pandemic has proven to be one of the world's um, worst threats to human health and the global economy in the past century. In April 2020, over one third of the world's 7.8 billion people were on lockdown. At this early stage, many East Asian countries took rapid stringent measures with European countries took more apprehensive, delayed and reactive responses. Restrictions of movement of freedom, um, sorry, restrictions of movement of free people fall under human rights violation. There is an exception for threats to national pandemic fall under. Some of the lists below that are violated by quarantine orders are the right to liberty, freedom of movement, freedom of religion to community with others, freedom of peaceful assembly and association. Liv, what is it that we need to consider to rebuild and strengthen our policies and expectations on our human rights? And that's to you, Liv. This way of life that we're now in with restrictions, they unfortunately do impede on our human rights. And that's a difficult situation to be in because it's something that we're all uncomfortable with. But as you say, they have been deemed necessary due to the pandemic, saying that the importance with our policies is that they are as transparent as they can be. Thank you. So sorry. Um, it started off really great. We will come back to you um, and we can finish off that conversation. Um, so, uh, Lena, if I come to you next... How has the pandemic impacted on human rights in Zimbabwe? Um, so, so when I think about that question, I think, you know, what appears most in terms of the violation of human rights is the issues around your social and economic rights of individuals. And so by way of lockdown or quarantining or social distancing, the terminology differs from geographies to geographies. I guess the inability to move, the inability of movement by people freely, I think, has negatively impacted, you know, one's ability to survive. More importantly, you know, the access to food, access to resources, and thereby put a stress on on one's livelihoods. So I think the economic security is really something that has, you know, put a huge concern on the population of Zimbabwe re-COVID. Um, and what that has also 
resulted is that a lot of individuals have lost their jobs or the ability to earn income because of being locked down or under quarantining or social distancing because they're now in confinement. And as a result, um, a significant number of um, Zimbabweans, I'm not sure if you're aware, but at least about 90% of them are in the informal sector and really rely on daily earnings and to survive. And because of this current pandemic, they're now having to rely on handouts, donations, if it's monetary or non-monetary. And so this has really put a strain on one's emotional well-being, their, um, their, well, their mental health. And, in, and this has resulted in increase of depression, stress and anxiety, and also, you know, grief when one has lost a loved one. So I think, you know, I would speak about those two, the economic and social, um, um, you know, violations in terms of the human rights. I think an additional one too, which I'd also like to share, I think the, pandem the pandemic has dealt on, um, is with regards to one's ability to access to health services. Um, you know, we're finding that at some hospitals, individuals are being denied access to medical attention because they can't produce current confirmation of the negative COVID tests. And so for many, the test is prohibitive. And, you know, a lot of them are being turned away and have to seek medical attention elsewhere. And so, you know, in all encompassing, I think the pandemic has really put a strain on the individual's mental well-being, their economic livelihoods, as well as their social livelihoods. And so, you know, we're finding that um, the differences in economic profile in Zimbabwe as compared to the UK, you know, there are differences in terms of how individuals are being impacted. Thank you so much, Lena, for sharing that information. And I think there's a commonality between, um, you know, the population as a whole in terms of the, the lockdown and how that has a major impact on people's um, well-being, whether that be physically and mentally. Um, so I think it's it's really hard for people because, you know, when we get up in the morning and we go to work or we have school runs to do or you know we have our daily tasks we have that sense of purpose and that sense of belonging and it provides meaning and stimulation to our day and when we don't have that that can actually negatively impact on our mental health and our physical health equally um so thank you for sharing that information with us um victor i'm going to come to you next um what uh, how has the pandemic impacted on human rights in nigeria Thanks, Claire. Thanks, Claire. Um, I, I feel like Lena has said a lot of the things that I wanted to say, um, but I will just focus on, on the legislative structures. Uh, in so many ways and in, in different varying levels, the, the pandemic has, has unraveled gaps in our systems and in the way that we operate and, and function as a society. It has also, should I say, um, made more obvious the, the lack of pre-existing structures uh, actually legislative structures um, um, in Nigeria because obviously um, in countries without systems that guard against human rights and abuse and protect um, the vulnerable population the disregard of their rights have become much more exacerbated in Nigeria for example we still use um, a pre-colonial law called the Lunacy Act which is already very much discriminatory even in its name and is not in keeping with any modern thinking or any ratified um, conventions. So this has enabled uh, a total disregard of the rights of persons living with mental conditions. And there are few existing structures with the power of public public um, uh, and legislative backing to challenge the system. Um, here in the UK, however, while there are gaps and it's not a perfect system, there are challenges, obviously because there are challenges in any system, there are however powerful lobbying groups with some form of support from the public. Um, like sometime in July, um, a coalition of organizations, mental organizations, came together to actually start to work on a paper um, that, that looks at how the government can recover better from the perspective of people who live with mental conditions. Um, here, the voices of persons who live with mental conditions are at least heard, and the laws have enabled this. Um, while it's not perfect, I, I'm still going to insist it's not, um, it gives room for discussions to happen and for improvements to be made. This is not so in Nigeria, where we have a long way to go to even changing these laws. As the, as the pandemic um, raged uh, and lockdowns were implemented across the country, many mental facilities were shut down as they couldn't access PPE and access to medications were limited or actually non-existent. 
but just as well, there were no structures that were set up to substitute for them as they were done for most other illnesses. Um, just like Lena said as well, uh, many people lost their sources of livelihood. Um, they had to modify their ways of living while trying to survive in a majority informal economy where people lived on small business ends. While some also lost their lives and lost loved ones who were like breadwinners in their, in their, in their families. Now, these very harsh changes in, in social determinants led to has led to rising rates of stressors to their mental health. Uh, for example, in, in my organization, we see uh, more than 130% increase in the number of persons that are seeking support for our crisis services. Some were suicidal and some attempted as well. Now, a classical example I'm going to end with is, is a question, really. Um, did you know that attempted suicide is still considered a crime in Nigeria? And in a public case that, that happened last month, a young man who tried to take his life had, was prosecuted by the, by the police and he, he, he spent weeks in jail and had to be bailed by, by civil society organizations. That's just an example that shows just how you know, lacking legislative structures are um, in, in, in Nigeria that it enables people to, to assess um, the services um, that, that are obviously that, that, that are necessary for them as humans. Um, okay, thank you. Um, a big factor in receiving funds and attention for programs is very likely a way to assess success. How can success be determined and shown? Uh, Victor, would you, um, I'll come to you. What would your opinion be on that question? Thank, thanks, Claire. Um, in, so many, in so many countries where there's no existing structures to actually you know, evaluate successful programs, um, it's very difficult to assess funding. It's like, it's, it's, I think there's it's some, some sort of dynamic that is it's where because of the lack of um, funding, you can actually create programs to be able to evaluate them. And because you don't have any evaluations done for some programs that have been created, you also can't assess funding. Um, so it goes, it goes back and forth. It's very important that we're able to show success. So I think one of the things that the World Health Organization has done, um, I would say, largely effectively is to be able to collate information from countries about existing programs and what has worked, uh, what kind of services they have. And I think that's part of the WHO, um, I, I can't really remember the exact name for that particular um, publication. So it is very important, but in some, in some places it's, it's very difficult. And I feel like in most, in most ways where we take risks, um, mental health is what taking the risk for without thinking about the, the existing data. Um, so we can already start investing in programs and also investing in ways to assess them right from the start. In terms of funding, it's vital that um, grassroots organisations, those uh, organisations that are doing a lot of work in the communities, um, can access funds, that can... Um, can provide those vital services in the community that are needed and you know within um, society within the whole kind of pandemic even there's been major funding cuts um, and funding is getting harder and harder for people to access um, however I do feel that you know funding does have a great impact on providing those vital services um, Lena do you have anything you would like to um, I guess for the friendship bench, um, data is really important and significant in terms of our measurement of success. And so, you know, we are currently working on in putting an, a huge investment in our monitoring and evaluation systems because the, the data helps us to improve and, um, you know, evaluate the performance and, um, in, you know, successes of the stories that we are able to share through our impact. And I, and I think, Collaboration is also one that we really, you know, put a huge emphasis on in terms of, you know, our local uh, implementing partners who, are, who enable us to scale um, because, you know, we believe in a very cost effective um, and efficient way of delivery in terms of a friendship bench. I'm not sure how many people are familiar with the friendship bench in that, you know, it's, it's the use of a physical bench that is placed in the communities um, and where individuals, you know, access it and so, uh, provide the support through community lay health workers or grandmothers, <clears throat> excuse me, as we like to commonly um, refer to them as. Um, and so they, the grandmothers provide cognitive behavioral therapy 
um, using a method of problem uh, solving uh, therapy, which enables one to use the bench as a creating a safe space to really articulate and, and address the challenges that they're having, you know, if it's, if it's to do with suicide or depression or anxiety or stress. And so by having the conversation with the grandmother, um, you know, the individuals who are accessing the services, you know, the grandmothers capture them by way of you know, noting the information that they receive um, in a book um, and making that reference to the friendship bench uh, um, team. Uh, we're also, because of the COVID 19 impact in terms of people's uh, being accessing the friendship bench through face to face, we've now utilized the use of the digital platforms. So, you know, we have opened up um, entities or information services like a WhatsApp group, as well as uh, we have the Inuka platform, which is a digital platform where people can utilize, you know, in terms of just wanting to share. And, and talk about the issues that they're challenged with. So for us, m and &E is important, setting up metrics, you know, number of people who've accessed the bench, um, number of referrals, because obviously, you know, there's certain um, issues that, you know, the, the counselors or the community layer health workers aren't able to address. So we employ a referral pathway, you know, where they then are able to then go and access services that we as an organization aren't able to assist them with. Um, so, you know, how many, and we also have what we call as the SSQ score, which also enables us to measure, you know, a number of people who are able to, who have returned back to the bench and the type of counseling services that they, they've received. So I think in a nutshell, I think, you know, just to cap it off, you know, data is important um, and feeding that into our um, funders and our potential partners Collaboration is also key in terms of, you know, telling our impact story. Thank you, um, Lena. We did actually have a question about how does the friendship bench work, but from what you've said, I think you've elaborated and explained that fully. So thank you so much. Um, we'll move on um, now to talk a little bit about education. So what more needs to be done in the way of education? Um, in a recent survey, um, in a recent COVID nineteen, sorry, start again. In a recent COVID nineteen mental health and wellbeing report from gov.uk, it showed a significant increase in anxiety, stating that anxiety is more common than depression, with sixty four percent of young people with high scores on the anxiety scale, and thirty four percent of young people experiencing depression. Lena, I'm going to come to you next. What, um, without schools and mental health services working more closely together, and without good early intervention, we will never address people, young people's mental health. What early interventions do you recommend and what? So I'd like to put a disclaimer out there that um, I myself am not a psychologist or a psychiatrist by profession. And so, you know, um, I'm in the field of learning. And so with regards to this question, I think, you know, it is really valid in terms of the need to look at a community and collaborative approach to addressing issues around mental health or, or mental well-being. Um, you know, as we're all aware, the youth population is increasing and, and increasing at a fast rate. I mean, if we bring it closer to home with regards to the Africa region, um, the UN report of 2019 states that um, by 2050, the youth population in Africa will rise to about 89%. And that matched with the high unemployment rate, I think will put a lot of pressure on young people, you know, resulting in an increase in depression and anxiety disorder. So I think, you know, the youth conversation needs to be had now. And it's a matter of urgency in terms of, you know, how do we provide um, accessible services for mental health? Because if we don't, we have you know, a time bomb that is just um, waiting to explode or, and, or implode, you know, for the individual concerned. And so I think early intervention is, is really key for young people. And I think it could start within the homes, um, it could start at, um, you know, primary uh, level in terms of integrating mental health within the curriculum. Um, I think the conversation around you know, one's mental health and one's mental being in terms of just talk therapy. It's important to talk, 
you know, get young, young people to recognize that there's nothing wrong in having the conversation and, you know, providing them with a safe space to have that conversation, I think will also reduce the stigma around mental health to say that, you know, just because you want to have a conversation about a particular issue or concern that you may have does not mean that there's anything psychologically wrong with you, but it's important to talk. And I think, you know, a lot of young people feel that they, you know, feel disregarded as, as a community and as a society. Um, and especially now with the digital era, you know, a lot of us are on our gadgets. And so there's that um, exclusion in terms of the community well-being or, or family approach in terms of, you know, getting together and having a conversation. So I think early intervention is key, um, integrating mental health within the curriculum and having the conversations around, you know, what mental health is, um, what it isn't, reducing the stigma um, and also access to training as well. I think, you know, could be provided to parents who are interested as well as teachers. Um, and then just, I think what I'd also just like to share is that, you know, we at the Friendship Bench have um, implemented um, the Youth Friendship Bench. And it's our way of being inclusive with regards to the youth population. And um, the Youth Friendship Bench is primarily targeted at university students where we're, where we're looking at responding to young people's mental health. And what we found out through research is that um, young people, you know, would prefer have, speaking to a person who's of similar age or a peer. And so, yes, you know, we have an interesting, un, you know, unconventional way through the bench and through the grandmothers. But I think the Youth Friendship Bench provides young people with an opportunity to articulate their fears and concerns um, through the Youth Friendship Bench. And the, we call them buddies and the buddies are trained um, through problem solving therapy and, you know, work around the universities as well as the communities. And um, we found that the young people are more willing to approach these buddies to, to seek the assistance um, rather than the traditional way of accessing mental health support through clinics, um, going to a private doctor, et cetera. And so I think um, just in conclusion, I think, yes, I'll just reiterate school education, um, include mental health within the curriculum, uh, develop com community-based approaches that, um, you know, both teachers and parents could be part of where they can engage and learn. Thank you so much, Lena, for sharing that with us. Um, yes, I think that um, you're absolutely correct. And I think uh, reforming and modernising mental health education is key to... Um, to providing that for our children and young people, but also parents and um, all generations. Um, I'm conscious of time, and um, but um, I'd just like to move to have an open discussion with um, our panel in um, looking at creating action points. So what is it that you feel um, we could think about in terms of um, actioning a point moving forward on an individual kind of community level. Lena, it might be introducing your um, friendship bench, um, not just across um, Nigeria, but, um, you know, globally, or um, we could be looking at that. Uh, then we need to think about a national action point and possibly international. So I'm going to um, open that up to the panel. Um, based on the information we've discussed this evening, is there anything you would like to put forward? Yeah, well, um, yeah, a lot of my my action point is focused on a particular solution that we, we, we are trying to pilot in, in Nigeria, and it's that if we are really keen to engage um, um, people who are not really, who I would say are out of reach um, in a population like Nigeria, most of the services, most of the learning and education that we offer for mental health conditions, um, and awareness is targeted, um, is online. So mostly the age group is for young people. Now, if we want to make sure that we reach a larger number of people in countries like Nigeria, then we need to make sure that we contextualize the information that we get um, in a way that they can understand it. So the solution that we are proposing is one that um, takes, just considers community members as experts in their own right. Um, we are working to create a database of mental health symptoms and related definitions in the various languages that exist in our communities 
and we do this by consulting committee members about their understanding and preform descriptions of these symptoms. What this leads to is that if people can differentiate between normal experiences in life and mental health symptoms, guided by their own expressions of these experiences and symptoms, then they'll be more likely to be receptive to learning and recommendations to seek help. Because now there's some kind of ownership. Um, it's no longer considered um, a strange disease or a white man's disease as it's mostly said to be in Nigeria. And there's an acknowledgement of its existence in the communities because these terms and these definitions are expressed in a way that they can relate to them and they can understand. So my real action point is to make sure that when we look at learning for mental health, when we look at mental awareness, we should also look at it from a very, very, um, I would say, database learning perspective where we go to the communities and try to understand how they see or how they express these symptoms and use that in return to create programs that work for these communities. Thank you so much, Victor. Um, and that's really great information as well. And I think there's lots of key elements that we can put into our action points, um, both at an individual community level, but also, you know, nationally as well. Um, so what I would like to suggest is from an individual and community um, based level, it might be that we um, would suggest an action point of uh, a reformed and modernized education system um, for children and young people going forward that is kind of on, on a mandatory level. Um, what would you what do you think on that Victor and Lena would you agree or do you want me to put that down yeah yeah, yeah. Um, and then from a um, national um, perspective um, a suggestion that I would like to put to you is um, significant investment into providing early intervention in every community by creating a 24-hour support system um, within the community for all age groups. Um, you know, based on information that, you know, you've shared with us, both of you this evening, Lena and Victor, and, you know, things that um, we've shared here in the UK, there seems to be an inconsistency with people accessing local services. And sometimes it would appear that people have to travel some distance to get that help and support they need. So um, I would like to put to you if if you are happy with that um my suggestion or if you have a a, a different suggestion um about these drop-in centers being 24 hours support um across all communities what would you what would you like me to put down for nationally yes i would agree to that um but and i also think um we are in a digital age so you know, we also need to recognize our young population. And so they're tech savvy. So how do we also look to integrating use of a digital platform? Um, and, and now because of the COVID era, you know, in terms of the social distancing, people may not be able to, you know, travel to a community center to access those resources. So, you know, how do we, what alternative and innovative ways can we provide um, you know, people so that they can access mental health. Thank you. Uh, I, I, I just go with that. Be conscious of time. I agree with all said. So, uh, welcome to everyone who's uh, joined this group on uh, maternal, newborn, and ad adolescent health. And and please, if you know, we're delighted to have you uh, join the group and, and contribute. And look forward to an interesting discussion this evening. Very much after the. Uh, introduction uh, by both our eminent key speakers talking about what we might learn from the pandemic uh, and particularly with the focus on um, newborn and child health. If I might just ask our uh, two panellists, starting with Emily, if that's possible, and then I'll work through Claire uh, and Fiona, perhaps as our rapporteur, talk through what uh, a little bit about themselves before we start. I'm, I'm told uh, to my I'm a family physician currently working in the community hospital. And my interest has basically been in adolescent health, especially social and reproductive health of adolescents, because I have a personal history with it and I have experiences 
where it has gone wrong and us as health workers would be able to, to help these adolescents to have a better better health so my interest basically is around that area and i'm really looking forward to fruitful discussions on how we can be able to help the adolescents better yes thank you Thank you, Emily. We look forward to uh, your uh, brief uh, talk uh, a little bit uh, later and we can ask some further questions. I'm sure that will generate lots of discussion. Claire, welcome. Thank you very much. And it's uh, really fantastic to be joining you all, especially on a on a Sunday evening, as it is in the UK. Um, I'm the um, founder and director of Children for Health, and I've been working in children and adolescent participation for over 30 years now with various partners from INGOs to governments to small community-based organisations. And um, I'm looking forward to just um, really positioning a few thoughts and ideas that have emerged for us over the last few months. And I hope that this generates some discussion because it would be great to make sure we have enough time to gather everybody's ideas and responses and reactions um, to some of the things that we talk about. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Claire. Fiona, I didn't know whether you wanted to introduce yourself. I think, think you've left the stage. So on, on the on the basis that I can't see you anymore, I might just uh, perhaps give some, some early reflections that I've had from working in um, my role as a neonatologist, uh, both in the UK, but also uh, with the Royal College of Paediatrics and Child Health uh, as a global health officer, directly involved in a number of programs um, in uh, low income, uh, low resource settings, and also indirectly through a range of partnership programs that we have um, uh, uh, across uh, low income settings. I think one of the things I often reflect on is that uh, neonatal children's uh, maternal adolescent services are often, I think, and I described this earlier as the Cinderella services of, of healthcare. They often don't get all the discussion uh, that they might merit. Uh, and I think that's perhaps for two reasons, um, particularly at the moment with COVID, two reasons that I've really reflected that that might have been um, more challenging is that uh, maternal, maternal and child health services have often had uh, a background of underinvestment in a number of different resource settings with perhaps limited resilience around how they might um, uh, be supported. And, and and perhaps because of uh, COVID, but not directly or significantly impacting on this particular population per se, there's been a real tan direct and tangible impact on a number of different, um, I think a number of different factors in those, in those healthcare environments. Staffing is one area, and that's something in my own setting, but also I've seen a number of our partnership programs where staff have been uh, redeployed, um, um, equipment's been re repurposed for adult use, Infrastructure has been uh, impacted with uh, adult services expanding into the neonatal and paediatric footprint, um, all of which has happened both, I think, in the UK and also very much in the conversations I've been having with partnerships uh, in the international arena. So this has led, I think, to increasingly compromised services, uh, not due directly perhaps to COVID itself, but because of, of COVID indirectly. And there's perhaps something we can think about how we can influence those discussions. Uh, moving forward. In addition, I've seen uh, in line with uh, some of the uh, uh, requirements uh, laid out by the WHO, UN, uh, PHE more locally, uh, things like social distancing, there's been a real reduction perhaps in how our families have been able to be part of that neonatal journey um, and how frequently they can visit their babies, how much time they can spend with them, uh, leading to a potential impact on the longer term outcome for these children. However, I think we should really look at things differently and see these as opportunities to think about how we might, in fact, develop and embed best practice. An example that springs to mind immediately might be kangaroo mother care, where mothers can actually be really included in the care they provide for their babies and support the delivery of care to their children on the neonatal and pediatric units. Finally, we've seen in this country and beyond the impact of non-COVID activity, including, I think, the reduce or delayed vaccination programmes, increased malnutrition with the World Food Programme talking about uh, or predicting a doubling in the number of cases of malnutrition disproportionately affecting uh, children this year. So I see it as my responsibility as a doctor but also that of the UN and WHO with a strong record in supporting child health to highlight the very real need to protect um, children's health 
and maternal adolescent health at local, regional, national and international levels through both advocacy, communication and collaboration. And this is where there's a real opportunity through events like tonight to really start to do that. And that is across both the public and private sectors, healthcare providers, government and international organisations. I really strongly and passionately feel we mustn't leave the children and adults of the future behind. So I'd now like to take the uh, opportunity to introduce uh, Dr Emily Timwakiri, who is working with the Bwindi Community Hospital, as you heard, in, in southwestern Uganda. I'm um, looking forward to hearing from you, Emily. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Sue, for your, uh, for your introduction. Ah, well, now, for example, like in Uganda, following COVID-19, they had school closure. After having school closure, most of the children, most of the young people had to go back home, and that included the majority of the adolescents who are still in school, who are still in school, and has been closed up to recently this week when actually they decided to open for the finalists. However, the repercussions that have come with that was that there has been a rise of adolescent pregnancies in the country. And it is alarmingly high, and I'm sure in the next survey they will do. They'll find that the current rate has risen from 25 percent, as per the last national survey that we had in Uganda, and it might not even be like 30 percent and beyond. But however, the alarming bit that alarmed me most was that when our president was giving his national address regarding resumption of school and about the adolescent pregnancies, he was like that it's okay for a child to become pregnant as because it will not kill them. However, COVID will kill them very fast. So he was trying to justify the reason that it's okay for them to have become pregnant because COVID is not killing them, that because they had closed schools. So it was really a, it was really a heartening statement coming from my national leader because it was showing that actually preventing adolescent pregnancy is not high on the priority list because he thinks that becoming pregnant when you're young has no psychological impact. But I have witnessed how adolescent pregnancy can actually have negative psychological impact because my mom produced me at 14 years of age and up to now, I still witness how it has psychologically affected her, even in her adult age. Like the, the repercussion of her having produced me at 14 years have followed her right into adulthood. Even currently, she sometimes still faces stigma from the community that she actually produced when she was young, when she was at her home, at her mother's home, and is still at her mother's home. So I have really seen how adolescent pregnancy can psychologically affect someone not only psychologically, but physically, because as a medical doctor now working in southwestern Uganda, I have encountered quite a number of adolescents who have had things go wrong, totally wrong, including death, including the loss of their uterus, meaning they cannot produce again in the future, many things. And I really, really saddens me that this adolescent has had to suffer so much on something that can be preventable. Because adolescent pregnancies are something that can easily be preventable with the wide availability of the contraceptive methods that we have. So then I wonder, so with this pandemic, I learned one important thing, and that is that actually formal schooling is protective to these adolescents. Because when they were in school, there wasn't an alarming rate of adolescent pregnancies. However, when there was school closure, they were now at home with no much activity to do and very redundant. And of course, they ended up experimenting with their bodies without little knowledge on how to go about it and without little protection. Because even because of the lockdown, there weren't easy movement in case some who knew that they can get family planning methods where they would easily get them from. So they were not protected. And of course, they ended up becoming pregnant. People in my community would always say that education is actually an informal family planning method whereby if a girl is in school, she's concentrating more in school and has no time for other extracurricular activities and also like moving around with boys and she's focused because she knows what she wants to attain because as a result of the education and she finds that pregnancy is delayed. And by the time a girl is thinking about pregnancy, it's after her, edu after her bachelor's degree. And by then you're in your 20s, like 24, 25. And I used to laugh at it, I'm like, no, but that, that's not true. But now with this COVID pandemic, I actually now agree with them more. 
And then so I was asking ourselves, what more can we do to help these adolescents and supporting them? And when I was, when I was reflecting back uh, regarding my mom's life, I, I realized that one thing that is key in rehabilitating these adolescents, for example, who have become pregnant is, is education. I believe education is one powerful empowerment tool that can be given to any individual. If I compare, like, for example, my life and my mother's life, it's totally different. And the difference that has brought it up is due to the education. For example, I, I am a single mother, and, but however, the society does not stigmatize me and give me a lot of psychological distress due to that fact because I am a medical doctor, I am educated, I am independent, and I am of value to society. So I do not get that stigma that my mother, who produced me, and her education did not go far, and who is still at home with my grandmother, faces. So you realize that actually education is a powerful empowerment tool to these young people. Then I wondered, I'm like, so what is going to happen to those, those adolescents who have become pregnant during this pandemic period? Because majority, their education is going to end. Because in our culture set, in our culture, in our culture you find that most parents, when a young girl becomes pregnant, they'll be like, no, this one, I think she's supposed to get married. She should stop schooling that we shouldn't waste our money on her because she has become pregnant. They look at it like, this young girl should not again be taken back to school. But should that be the case? Should her becoming pregnant be, mean that her life should end? That her future should just be terminated like that and that she will lack the empowerment and the independence that she will need to live a meaningful life? So I'm wondering how can we ensure that these girls who have become pregnant they're able to resume school when schools, when the situation stabilizes and schools have opened. And when they resume school, how are we going to ensure that we minimize the stigma they receive from not only the, the students, but the teachers themselves and the adults around them? How are we going to ensure that we shall support their psychological, give them psychological support to ensure that it does not have a lasting negative impact that will even be carried on to their adulthood? So those are the questions that have been pondering in my head, and I'm wondering how are we going to support this? Because the fact is, for us in Uganda, adolescent pregnancies have increased, and all because the, the adolescents were not in school, they were at home, and they had didn't have access to the family planning services for those ones who even knew about them, because movement was also limited. So you'd find that going to the health facility to get the services they need is also limited. And also the other worrying bit is that those ones who are pregnant may not even be able to access the health facilities for safe delivery in time. And of course, they get also the lasting negative impacts, which can even lead to maternal death, fistula, many things that really I have witnessed as, as a medical doctor working in southwestern Uganda as a result of, of people not being able to access the health services that they need. So that is the brief presentation I really had. So Emily, thank you very much. Uh, and, and for those of you who've noted, I apologize that it says uh, uh, Zimbabwe under Emily's uh, title. Uh, it is in fact in uh, Uganda. So uh, I, I hope that clears some of the comments. But, but Emily, thank you very much. It's an incredibly powerful story uh, and, and really goes to demonstrate how school is, uh, education school in its broader sense is protective in, in so many different ways for uh, uh, adolescents, uh, uh, but not just those who are in school now, but also how do we get those children back into school where they've perhaps had a different experience over the last nine months? So we don't forget those children, that we also look after them moving forward uh, uh, and, and that we have a way to, to support them back into education and a future for themselves and their children. I'm sure there'll be lots of questions, but before we come to those in the final panel session, um, it would be good if we uh, can perhaps move now to Claire Hanbury uh, as the director for uh, Children for Health. Claire, welcome and look forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me all right? Uh, yes, I think we can. Great. 
Um, Emily, that was a great introduction and a thumbs up, really, for the kinds of work that we're involved with at Children for Health. Um, Because our primary task is to focus on education and on what the adolescents themselves already know and do about their health or about a particular health topic. And we work with partners to build on this, ensuring that the adolescents are part of the school, the family, the community engagement strategies that involve maybe the school, maybe the health centre or other um, other places which reach adolescents in, in a particular community. As we all know, children and adolescents in their daily lives, they contribute towards their health in multiple ways. One really obvious one is that they take, um, they have a role in caring for their younger siblings, often friends and so on. And at Children for Health, we've been directly involved in embedding um, participatory approaches to nutrition education in Mozambique and in diarrhea prevention and control uh, programs in Nigeria and India. And I raised those just as some examples. There's a lot of other things that we do as well. But what does that actually mean in practice? We know that children take care of young siblings and friends. We know they spend a great deal of time in the company of other children. We know that children and adolescents learn from and influence each other. So uh, together with the children, we understand the complexity of the context for example, for the dietary choices and the habits of a family or the ways in which they might be approaching personal, family and community hygiene. Or, I mean, in, in what Emily has been talking about, the sexual reproductive health, we use that as a starting point. And then we find out what ideas they have of bringing new information or practices into the family and figuring out how to start. For example, by asking a question with that family and starting a discussion. And so using these and other methods, we find that dietary changes, hygiene practices and many other things besides adolescents themselves can be part of building that team effort towards better health. And we know that our programmes are exceptions and that there's a general lack of acknowledgement, let alone engagement with young people in many, many health programmes. Most programmes provide health services or health education to adolescents. And the question I always have in my mind is why adolescents and children's capabilities with those roles that we know they have are so often left out of child and adolescent um, child and adolescent health strategies, when their resourcefulness, their influence, their competency in family and community health is so obvious. I expect many people here might be asking questions about the research and the evidence, and um, perhaps it's a story in itself that for 30 years I've been trying to build research partnerships and look into building proper evidence for this work, and I'm still trying. <laughs> There are some highly specific studies and we've got a literature review which I can send to send around. So thinking more specifically about the COVID pandemic, um, since our inception in, um, in 2013, our focus so far has mostly been on physical health issues and most, mostly linked to about 10 health topics. But since this pandemic, we've been using digital tools to consult many people in our network work and we've been finding out more about mental well-being and health and now it seems that this is a conversation for the many and not the few. The conversations around mental well-being and health and resilience need to change to be normalised, to combat stigma and to empower. And due to current circumstances, children and young people in, and in fact all of us have had to find our own solutions, which has perhaps empowered us to believe that we can handle more than we thought. For some, obviously, this period had been a real struggle, and many issues raised by Emily are also issues faced by many of our partners too. But an opportunity has arisen from this, and it's the urgency to need to, to start talking and teaching about social, emotional and physical resilience in a way that we haven't before. And with shared personal experience comes shared learning, shared solutions and shared recovery. So I was asked to kind of look slightly at the 
um, bigger picture and um, how we can move forward more collaboratively across international boundaries. This does seem very grand for an organisation such as ours. But it's interesting. I've been listening to a lot of podcasts lately, even one about nuclear disarmament and the nuclear threat. And actually, even the people at the very highest levels and right now talking about these kinds of issues are also talking about emotional intelligence. Sorting out most of our problems starts with the variables. This is your truth. This is my truth. Let's navigate to a shared truth. This requires dialogue, cooperative exercises, understanding, making connections and navigating complexity together. Emotional intelligence, the key skills are speaking up, holding leaders accountable, critical thinking. So let us take a closer look at how we in our systems, in our health systems and our education systems can develop emotional intelligence across um, across these across these systems. Emotional intelligence is an alternative to the overly cognitive centered approaches to the human mind. And what we found in Children for Health is that through the methodology, which is this participatory life skills based methodology, we're also developing aspects of that emotional intelligence. So I would really be so interested to know um, with the people listening today and with the discussion that I hope we're going to have is um, if you agree, if you think in your communities that this is a, an important thing, and if so, how can we really start building this up in a much, much bigger way than it is at the moment? Thank you very much. Claire, thank you very much. It was a, 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 an excellent talk to follow on uh, from that of Emily, and I was particularly uh, interested in the approach that Children for Health take around uh, participatory life skills based approach to uh, to training and really moving away from programs that do things to children but have a very different way of, of working. So I'm not sure, um, I encourage um, all of those who are on uh, listening to this um, who, who want to contribute to the conversation to pop something in the in the chat box or in the questions box and we'll happily uh, include those in the conversation with myself, Claire and Emily, but particularly Claire and Emily. But just to start that, I just wonder, uh, Emily, uh, if you're able to join us back on the stage along with Claire, what um, what do you what actions do you think we need to take at a perhaps national and international level uh, to um, uh, to change uh, to really reflect on what we've learned in the pandemic and change adolescents to healthcare and education uh, moving forward. One of the thing, one of the approaches that we take when we're working, let's say on any any kind of topic, is that we look at what is already in the system. So that might be a review of the primary school curriculum. It might be a review of the usually the sort of bottom secondary um, curriculum. We look at what's already in the curriculum for the healthcare workers. So we're also looking at health systems. So we're looking what the starting points are. And then I think people ought to be having a discussion about what we've learned from COVID, what we now think is more important than perhaps what was there before. And how do we start to slowly build into these systems, these, um, these new ways of either thinking or these new topics? And then you start experimenting with that and then building from there. But I would like to see... Certainly, you know, yes, we've got our policy makers and our strategies and all of that. I would see quite a lot of ways in which this sort of bottom up can work and, um, and, and implementing what we call like things like participatory inquiry processes, where you get all the stakeholders at different levels, all participating in these kinds of processes. Because if you're wanting to change somebody's health from a to be, you need to really understand what is what what that you know the context in which that person is making those choices. Often they're very good reasons, and then if you want them to shift, even a simple thing like washing your hands or improving your diet or taking vaccinations is maybe going to be a big one. You know, getting people ready to to be vaccinated, things like that. So it's 
it's using a much more empowering participatory approach really across the board that I would like to see. Also, we have health education, for example, with adults. It's about how do you become pregnant? How can you protect yourself from becoming? If you try to bring in like that education aspect of teaching them about reproductive health, the, the, the community will look at you as if your teacher was to know since they are not yet of age. But with that mistake that is being made, you find that these adolescents will still go ahead and have sex, and the result is the pregnancy. So if you could also change our curriculum and incorporate the reproductive health, so that these adolescents are able to learn more about how they become pregnant and how they can protect themselves from pregnancy, and the repercussions of becoming pregnant at a young age, I'm sure they would be able to make more informed and better decisions that would protect them. And when it comes to these the adolescents who have already become pregnant, how are you going to rehabilitate them? One of the things I would look at is, is first of all, uh, to minimize the stigma that they get from the community as a result of this, because that stigma has a serious negative impact on their health and on their lives. So say that like stigmatizes them, they're like it's as if you made the biggest crime to become pregnant at that young age. So how are we going to also prepare the society to actually not stop stigmatizing these young people is the other thing that you also need to work on. And then back to school, like getting them back to school for education. Most parents in Uganda, once a girl becomes pregnant, They'll be like, no, this one should stop schooling. We should not waste our money on their education. So if if these parents are able to, they are by law required to take them back to school, I think it would have better results because all those girls will be able to go back to school. And then when they go back to school, how are they going to be supported? If they are given a conducive environment, not being treated like they are aliens, they are bad people, they become pregnant and that they should be stigmatized because of that, it would be so helpful for these young adults. Emily, just, just on some uh, comments that you've made. Uh, quite a lot of discussion in the um, chat boxes, particularly thinking broadly around uh, the risk to um, young women from gender-based violence and, and leading to pregnancy, and your experience of that. And what we might do is work more closely aligned with, with other UN organizations, perhaps UN peacekeeping organizations, in, in uh, some of the um, uh, settings that we've just been discussing. What are your thoughts on that? What's my thoughts? My question for this question, this question for the health logistics. For example, like we also have very many cases of repeat pregnancies with these adolescents. These adolescents were given family planning, like postpartum family planning after they deliver, then they be protected from that repeat pregnancy. But then you find that there are also a lot of um, stigma towards a young an adolescent getting family planning services in the Ugandan health facility. First of all, you get stigma from the adults that are around in the health facility. Then you get stigma from even the health some of the health workers themselves. They'll be like. A younger like you, what do you want family planning for? And of course, with all that, it prevents them from getting the services that they need. So, so I'm wondering how best can we ensure that these adolescents are able to access the family planning services that are even readily available in all the government facilities in Uganda? So they're able to access them freely without fear of stigma and also uh, being denied the service as a result so that they're able to be protected better. Uh, thank you, Emily. Uh, Claire, uh, do you have any experience of working with uh, other agencies, WHO, um, uh, the UN, uh, in uh, the part of the project you've been working in? Uh, yes, I have experience, and I've also worked in numerous um, settings uh, where people are living as refugees in um, different places in uh, Ethiopia, Kenya, and so on. And, you know, it's a boring answer always from me because it's always the same which is about you know stigma and stigma around pregnancy is all about fear and it's all about the kind of 
the the fears around you know and and something and, and so in order for that stigma to be reduced to something that needs we need to be dealing with that fear would you agree emily and 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 the only way you can really do that is very very engaged and deep conversations and then and to do that you need to provide a really um a good environment in which people can really express themselves and so what we're talking about here is less about the pregnancies and that although the sexual reproductive health is really important but if we can equip these children and their parents with the sort of social and emotional resilience and well-being and life skills to so that we go in through the lens of really understanding how do we talk to each other because a lot of that kind of education or non-education is that parents aren't talking to the the adolescents about these things that they need to be talking to them about they rely on the schools the schools rely on the parents the parents you know and so they're in a vacuum of non-information so it's all about those supported conversations and there's one uh, there's one person that i i like very much who i follow um his blogs and his websites and things and he says really one of the main ways we can change the world is through good conversation and good conversation between two or between two groups like adolescents and their parents is about having the skills to really listen to each other and really understand each other and so uh, and that is the starting point just the information do this do that don't do this don't do that it's not going to work it's not going to work with sexual reproductive health or diet or using a bed net or any of those things we know it doesn't work so this level this layer of social and emotional learning which is you know there's a lot of evidence now that's coming up as stanford are doing an amazing job with um some methodologies um and we really need to be pulling this into our our education systems but also the health clinics when they talk to parents and uh and so on and so forth so i'm sorry that's, a, that's a slightly repeating what i've said before but um that's what i found and i found when i've worked with street children when i've worked with people in work living in refugee camps this kind of methodology it works everywhere thank you uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much yes for for that actually when you mentioned it i realized it's one problem we have also in uganda like who who gives these adolescents the health education that they need the parents are saying the teachers will give them an in school but then in school in school they back no it's the duty of the parents and then you find that there's one time in uganda they wanted to introduce sex education which had more of a productive health education into the school curriculum that the teachers have to deal with it but then because the parents were misinformed they thought that they're going to teach them about sex then all the parents started collecting uh, signatures to ensure that parliament does not actually pass that bill of, of introducing sex education into to the curriculum so that the students there's a curriculum they teach them about reproductive health and they have more more information and they're able to make more informed decisions but then even these parents they are um, they are not well equipped and ready to give this education to their children like for example in our culture you find that my mother will not find it very easy to talk to me about about uh, sexual relations and reproductive health but to rather send me to my aunt that they so they consider that as part of the aunt's role to be the one to educate you about all that so you find that there's even no open communication like in our cultural setting between the daughters or the sons and their fathers or the daughters and their mothers regarding this important aspect of health and so there's a vacuum there's a big vacuum in regarding what they know about this but by nature of adolescence their bodies are reacting up and they are they, they are prone to experimenting and the process of experimenting you find that they become pregnant so the question now that comes to mind is who should be responsible for even providing this education to these adolescents for providing because you know knowledge is power 
So if they know how to prevent themselves from becoming pregnant, if they know the repercussions of becoming pregnant at a young age, I'm sure most of them would try to protect themselves from being pregnant. I think that's why like in the Western world, you'll find that there are fewer adolescent pregnancies because their adolescents are more empowered with the knowledge that they need compared to us, like in our African setting, where everyone is shy to talk about this, about that. There are very few mothers in, for example, in Uganda, who are able to openly share with their daughters about reproductive health. Or even young girls who are able to comfortably approach their mother to ask them about it. Because first of all, the first thing that the parents will do is start like assuring you, why are you starting to think about this? You're supposed to be doing ABC, don't even think about boys. And because of that, the adolescents, yeah, so there's also a vacuum in who is going to do the reproductive health education for these younger adolescents because they need to know so that they are able to make informed decisions regarding their health. Emily, thank you. So if we were to think of two or three really concrete actions to change things for, for young adolescents, what, what do you think they should be? What I think there should be, number one, there should be um, a concrete plan on how these adolescents are going to be given reproductive health education. Because without information, when they have it, they're able to protect themselves. They're able to make informed decisions, they're able to, protect, to prevent pregnancy, and they're able to, and when they prevent themselves from getting pregnant, they are well protected. So I think that is one other. And then also the other issue is those ones who have become pregnant. What package are, school, are the schools going to have for them, like of psychological support? And how are we going to ensure that we further educate the society so that not to further add on the psychological distress to these young girls who are pregnant and they are better supported? Because it really has a negative impact that I have had to witness from first experience with my mom and very many other people that I have seen. So it's one other thing that really needs to be looked at. But most importantly, the reproductive health education for these adolescents. Who should do it? Where should it lie? If the teachers in the schools where they spend majority of their time, they are prohibited from giving them such education. And then the parents who are ideally supposed to do it do not have time and they fear to, uh, to, uh, to do such education. So when are they going to get this education? It, when they're in adolescents, their bodies are reacting and they... They are, they are prone to experiment and find out why am I feeling like this? Why is it that when this and this happens, that this happens? So I think we need to look at the education systems. Where should it lie? Should, it, should we leave it at the hands of the parents who are also not trained on how to actually give the children this education? Or should it be incorporated in the school education so that they get it in a, in a more planned and organized way? Um, I mean, I think one way I've seen some countries get around this is that they talk about a life skills based health education. So what they're doing is they're teaching the life skills and they're not saying to the parents, we're doing sex education. It's a life skills based education. And then part of the content of that life skills based education are um, um, ideas around relationships and friendships and when friendships turn turn special and you know it, you, it can be done in a very soft way now there are some international guidelines for those listening um unesco many years you know quite a few years ago developed sexual reproductive health curriculum um very well laid out in my view it's a little bit too much too soon um because you're not wanting necessarily to when the children are in their um, concrete operational thinking phase. You don't want to get them abstracting and trying to make sense of things that they can't make sense of. But that would be my kind of slight uh, criticism, if you like, of the curriculum. Even for me as a Western mother, I found that curriculum too much too soon. But nevertheless, there have been a lot of experts who've helped to develop that. And then there is resources like the AIDS Alliance have an absolutely excellent curriculum, which they've developed. And again, it's a really softly, softly approach into the, you know, in, into giving the, giving the children, equipping the children with the information they need so that they delay sex, which is what we want them to do. And, um, and so I think that would be my, uh, uh, and I'm sure I could think of other things if, if people wanted to 
um, we can make some resource lists for people on that particular issue. And I know we've been talking a lot this evening about um, sexual reproductive health, but to kind of like support both the issue and Emily here, I've had consultations with partners all over. And this is the one thing that's been happening everywhere is that the children have been going to the villages because there's no school and and girls are getting pregnant. Um, and then the other thing I would add is the girls um, empowering those girls. So, yes, we want to support them. But we also like you mentioned, Emily, with your mother, you know, giving her that feeling that her life isn't over, that, you know, she's got a lot to do in her life, you know, and it's not that she has to just like submit to this situation, but really empowering them and getting them to stand tall despite the, that they're pregnant and they're going to have their babies and so on. So it's support to make sure that they're psychologically strong, but it's also saying, look, you can still do a lot with your life and giving them that sort of empowerment piece as well. Thank you to you both. So very in, inspiring words there. And I think I just wanted to highlight a, a, a comment from uh, Janet Jackson from, I think, uh, uh, who has just also highlighted, and I think it's a really important observation and, and might resonate with, with both of you, that women may not be in the front line of, of fighting, but they're often caught in the crossfire. Uh, and that they're, they're absolutely critical to keep uh, society and families um, uh, safe uh, in conflict. Therefore, they're absolutely in integral for, for peace and security. And I, I think that's really something that that perhaps resonates with, with some of what you've discussed tangentially, but also uh, very directly, that there's perhaps uh, a broader area of focus. I was reflecting that, that there is perhaps greater opportunities through forums uh, such as this for cross-border, cross-organizational uh, learning, and perhaps working with uh, partner bodies that are already uh, uh, closely um, located. I was thinking, uh, Emily, one of the uh, uh, questions that came up was from uh, Ewan Grant in London, who had raised the question of the UN peacekeeping organization, uh, uh, MONUSCO, which is in uh, DRC, I think, and whether there's any ever, with the sort of inspirational work that's happening uh, that, that you are so closely aligned with, there's opportunities for sharing with uh, other organized partner organizations that are nearby, or how is that encouraged? Is that possible? Is there no capacity? for that and I was just interested in your reflection on that thank you very much because any 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 help any cooperation from any organization to try to help with that adolescent is always can end up with any country would want healthy adolescents because the adolescents they are the future they are ones they are going to grow up and become now the adults of any nation so of course any opportunities that are there towards improving the life of these adolescents would be highly welcome i would i would run to participate in such in such activities to make the adolescents lives better because it really saddens me when i have to see when i encounter an adolescent who's whose life has been negatively impacted by just one action that was actually out of their control. Just one simple action that even left them, I think like even like 10 minutes or even a few minutes just made their life totally change for the worse. So any, any collaboration, any work that would really be, would really be welcome to surely support these adults and that they, they have a better meaning like just just to add one thing um it just occurred to me when you mentioned about the groups of course we've been talking a lot about the clinics and about the schools and about the school systems but in every community there's the faith leaders and the women's groups and we you know these are the groups that need to be engaged and uh you know usually part of the processes that we run in communities you know finding where the web of contact is around the adolescent and then making sure that you touch in with those influencers around the lives of the adolescents and using the the existing power that they already have with you know in the communities and with the adolescents and and so on and, and really build on what's already there too many programs i've seen over the years in quite a long career in development are these programs that are being cooked up 
somewhere else, you know, even if it's a capital city and it's not international, even if it's a, you know, in an office in a town for a community that's even 20 miles away. And, and, and then that program lands and it's not, it's, it's kind of taking away from the people there rather than building the people up themselves. So we need to tr maybe train our development workers so that they're, they feel better equipped to do this sort of work as well. So we might just have time for one last question. We've got a few minutes remaining and uh, from uh, Samuel, who has uh, raised a question. How could a country like Sierra Leone, with a very less uh, form formal education, um, uh, talk uh, really embed uh, some of the education we've been talking about? Samuel, I hope I've captured that correct question correctly. Claire, Emily, any thoughts on that in a less formal environment where education isn't quite so uh, uh, necessarily so easy to access? Well, the approaches that we're talking about are more suitable for an informal environment because they don't have to battle with the systems. So, um, and as for, you know, patriarchal, it's, it's again, being aware of the context in which you're starting this work and, and that building that awareness and, and character into what you're trying to do. It's part of the identity of that programme. If I'm to look at providing like health education in a non-formal environment, for example, you'd have to look at your setting, what is there. If I am to look at the Ugandan setting, it, it is what I'm more familiar with. For example, if I am to do an informal health education targeting the adolescents, I'd most likely use radio talk shows because most adolescents have access to the radios. So I'd use more radio talk shows where like health workers, have like time to, to go to the radios and they talk and teach these adolescents about reproductive health. I'm sure when one adolescent, see, uh, adolescent hears, it, hears about it on radio, they'll go and inform their other friends about it. So I think it depends on the avenues that you have which, which, which lead you to adolescents. For example, like in Uganda, one informal quickest method I would use is radio talk shows. Like almost all radios in Uganda, if they had like a time where they have a session for adolescents, who talks for adolescents, it would really reach out to very many, including those ones who are not in school. Thank you both very much. So I, I think we're almost certainly very shortly going to be uh, back in the uh, main uh, forum. So I think all that it remains for me to say uh, as we join that a, a huge thank you to both Emily and uh, Claire. It's been an absolute privilege to be on a panel with you and hear your quite inspirational um, stories. And I'm sure that we could chat and have a conversation for a lot longer. It is always hard in some ways on IT not to be in the same space, but actually in many ways, we've also got the privilege of, of uh, a much wider community joining the discussion. and. In a final reflection, I, I really think through what you've both so eloquently described, advocacy, communication, collaboration, we can really change the future for the children who are our future and, and they deserve the best future that we can provide for them. Any final last last comments from you, Claire or Emily, before, before we draw this session to a close? All that remains for me is to say thank you to you all. Thank you very much. Welcome back, everyone. Um, I dropped into a number of the conversations just now, and what a great set of panelists I was listening to. So thank you, everyone, for joining in. We'd now like to hear from each breakout group the key findings and actions that came out of the conversations and that can take, be taken forwards at individual, community, national or international levels. Each rapporteur will have three minutes, and let's start with the pandemics breakout group, please. Um, so we discussed a lot of things um, in the health emergencies and pandemic preparedness, but these are the salient points. So we discussed at an individual level to encourage peer education, peer support, and empower individuals to highlight their priorities to local actors. At community level, we discuss firstly to utilise local actors, including young local leaders um, and NGOs for community education and social mobilisation projects. Secondly, we discuss to engage with communities on their priorities, 
um, not ours, so to listen to them, which may not always be disease prevention, but also access to food, access to education or sexual health, for example. We discussed at a national level that firstly, community engagement should be prioritised, as it often isn't always. Um, those leading this community engagement should be representative of that community and community engagement as well as national planning should be initiated before the pandemic begins so early. Um, secondly, at a national level, we discussed that we need to be aware that local and national lockdown has a multitude of secondary negative effects, including social, economic and mental health effects. So with this in mind, we need to be transparent around significant plans, for example, closing schools or initiating lockdowns and allow some form of feedback mechanism when doing that. Lastly, at an international level, um, we discussed that outbreaks are behavioural at their core. Um, so this is necessary at every level, really. But high quality data is needed, including social data. So anthropological community specific data, anecdotal evidence, qualitative data, as well as epidemiological measures, um, which can assess the effect of pandemic control measures. Thank you. Thank you, Damien. Um, sorry, we had a few technical difficulties in our group, but um, just to summarise our main action points. Um, on an individual level, we discussed the importance of um, really promoting partnerships between individuals and imaginative partnerships and trying to promote open discussions between um, various individuals. We had some examples of good practice. So we had examples of medical educators collaborating with medical students to encourage diversity of the medical um, curriculum. Um, and we also talked a lot about healthy behaviours from the individual level. Um, obviously risk factor management, so things like smoking cessation um, and levels of activity were things that we touched on in that level. We moved on to the community level and recognised that it, it promotes the flexibility to adapt to local need, which is quite unique to the community level of action. We talked about combining health and social care um, to be able to provide more holistic approach and to be able to empower individuals to act in a healthy way. Um, and we talked about more concrete strategies from a logist logistical point of view to encourage um, healthy behaviour. So looking at the actual physical space in which individuals are operating. We found a lot of examples such as bike lanes and discussed the positive effect that just placing a bike lane in the context of the pandemic has had on certain communities and for, um, encouraging exercise. And we talked about free school meals and healthy behaviours to, to various different groups through initiatives like free school meals. Um, we then looked at the national level and we agreed that national priorities could include avoiding inequality, well, promoting health equality and avoiding division. So um, having a national discussion that, see, that involves all groups across countries. And we also talked about the dangers of targeted marketing when talking about healthy behaviours, things like advertising unhealthy um, foods to, to certain individuals and trying to avoid that on a national level. Mm. And then finally, internationally, we've talked about the, the benefits that can be had from learning from others. So the benefits of shared knowledge between countries. Um, often that can be forgotten in, we talked about medical education and how traditionally that focuses only on Western medical education that talks about the benefits of learning from others on an international scale and the exchange of good practices between countries and setting standards like minimum safety standards for, for healthcare practices as well. Interesting, isn't it, how a lot of them cross over and intersect on what's being said. We move to digital and UHC, please. Um, we're going to have to move on from that. We seem to have lost the chair and the rapporteur from, from that group. We'll hopefully get them at the end. I'll let you know if they, they, they've come back. Uh, we'll move okay. on. Okay. Um, so how about mental health next?
Well, not Liv Green's um, microphone is off. Sorry, Liv, can you turn your microphone and your camera on, please? We've had difficulty hearing her, even though she's down the road from me in, in Cambridge. Shall, shall we move on to the last one, Sue? And if I see if I can bring um, um, Ella on for the... Uh, please do. So um, maternal and, child, and adolescent child health would be great. Ella, we need your micro uh, microphone on, on too. Hi, sorry. Um, I was maternal and adolescent health. Good. <laughs> Come on then, Fiona. We need to put Fiona on. Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, so we've had a lot of the same um, themes coming up. On an individual level, we talked about how to increase willingness and ability to engage in a conversation between different generations and the importance of that in reducing stigma. And then similarly, at the community level, um, we discussed the importance of improving access to family planning um, and also knowledge on family planning um, and the ability that this has in both um, preventing um, unwanted pregnancies and also um, in reducing stigma among the community. Um, and we also ta talked about the importance of participatory approaches in this and really involving the community at every stage of the decision making and programmes that are occurring and that this could hopefully um, increase empowerment in mothers and adolescents. Um, and then on the national level, we talked a lot about how the national curriculum um, is important um, in this, each specific country and how that this could be changed to include um, sexual and reproductive health rights. Um, and also that if, if that was done, it would, it would, it would enable learning um, to reduce the stigma at the community level um, and the possibility of calling this life skills education. So actually we're teaching about all different aspects. Uh, aspects of life, um, mental health, um, sexual and reproductive health rights um, overall. And then at an international level, um, we, we discussed the importance of internationally promoting the importance of sexual and reproductive health rights and, and the possibility of encouraging different governments to put that on their national agenda um, and also normalising the conversation of mental health and well-being at an international level, especially um, during uh, the COVID pandemic, and that everybody is experiencing it differently, and that that at an international level is especially important at the moment um, to ensure uh, recovery in, and move, moving forward. So, in fact, we do have some written feedback. I'm just going to call it up in order that others can um, hear about it. If I can find it, I find it uh, quite difficult to do the technology myself. So it was the maternal baby and adolescence bit. No, we're not missing that. Which bit are we missing? The mental health. So they felt individually we need to understand our own mental health, how to manage it. Again, this concept of normalizing conversation educating patients as well as parents as well as young people a lot of good discussion which i heard and, and valued on the friendship bench initiative that started in zimbabwe uh, peer mentor school um, schemes and schools and uh, engaging out of reach people online um, nationally the need for investment in opportunities and in 24-hour centers internationally needing best practice guidelines and effective training across countries to inc increase the number of professionals. So I think that does conclude our reporting back from the uh, rapporteurs. And I want to thank you. Um, and clearly, um, though it's a great platform, we've all had a few problems with it. So let me just summarize what I think we have heard today. We have heard many thoughtful points and people joined in the discussion openly and freely. And there were synergies across what everyone was saying. 
we all heard that we know that if people move early with prevention or early action or intervention, it pays off. It pays off for individuals, for communities, for nations and the world. It pays off for pandemics. It pays off for mental health and for physical disease. So we know that it can be done and it should be done. We've seen how telemedicine platforms can help access and indeed digital can leapfrog and complement other systems. But we also know that these digital systems, our data systems need to join up and they need to be contextualized for them to work most effectively. We heard many examples locally of things that work and help people. And let me just pick up the friendship bench to support people with mental health problems and how in this time of a pandemic, it has been made digital so that the support and the help can be ongoing. Isn't that an inspiring story for all? But we've also heard about harm, that there's not enough capacity and infrastructure in our systems across the world to handle the pandemic effectively, let alone having the strong enough health systems to provide universal health care. This needs to start with good education in schools. Schools don't address infection and pandemic routinely. They don't address prevention of ill health, nor do they address mental health. And that then led us to a discussion about the need to normalize talking about mental ill health, physical ill health, and the need to prevent ill health in many different ways and the need to move early for action. And at this time, of course, the need is for face masks, physical distance, and washing hands and, and sanitation. But normalizing the discussion is terribly important. There was a call, which I support and I know our government does, to have sex and reproductive health rights recognized across the world, pushed nationally and globally. But we also heard about how during this pandemic, there's a real lack of transparency about plans and, and poor communications. And that takes us back to what can work well, but hasn't done well enough in many countries as yet. We need to engage the communities early and effectively. We need communities to help prioritize what matters, and we need to bring in the NGOs. And as we work going forwards, we all want clear metrics for success, and we know that we can only make it happen if there's peer support and local support. But actually, people highlighted that to respond effectively to pandemics, to improve mental health, to do many other things, we need full data transparently available, though, of course, personal privacy. And that full data is not just about healthcare outcomes and healthcare interactions for the pandemic and arguably for mental health as well. It includes social data, economic data, mobility data, and more. So really, we need to make sure that we have effective data systems that join up, that can bring together all the different sorts of data that the communities need to respond, that the nations need. But don't forget that many things that you do digitally will need contextualizing and putting into context. So we've discussed today a number of issues. We've talked about 
the pandemic and our responses across the world, about non-communicable diseases, about digital health and digital technologies to improve health, universal health coverage, mental health, maternal and adolescent health care. And the message to the UN and the WHO rings true across all these things. Through your normative work and guidance, you can make a big difference. But also, you work with the politicians and the policy makers on behalf of all of us. You need to help them understand the priorities of the public, help them to understand that they need to engage their communities and their NGOs, and help them to bring together their data effectively for best responses. So I hope that that is a true reflection of where we've come from. It's clear that digital access to healthcare is a priority, both for universal access to everything and for NCDs. It is too for mental health. We know that education underpins health and prosperity. So all of that needs action. And how, when we know healthcare is a human right and should be for all, can we do this without good education? There are more questions almost than answers. But one thing is certain. I want to finish with this certainty. More investment is needed in health. Health is one of the primary assets, not only of people and families, but of nations. It leads to economic productivity. So more investment so that we do have the capacity, the infrastructure, and the capability to make health a reality for all our people. Thank you. So thank you, James Sally. Thank you very, very much for all you said this evening. Thank you too for the chairs and the panelists and the rapporteurs. And thank you for the audience and also our technical team who were really, really put through it tonight. And I apologize, giving them such a hard time. Um, just to remind you all that we have workshops running every night this week. Um, with a conference on Saturday afternoon where we'll be um, getting all the different feedback from all the different workshops um, and as well as um, the Brian Urquhart Award and we will have the um, concert in the evening. So tomorrow night we'll have the food security workshop. That's tomorrow night. On Tuesday we have the environment and security workshop with Jonathan Porritt and Mark Linus. Uh, Saturday, as I say, we had the report back. And final evening um, concert on on Saturday night, which I hope a lot of you will tune into because it's, it's looking at the people who made the UN, what it is, the heroes, the heroines, what's going on now and basically what we want to have happen in the future. And that's what this evening and what the whole week is all about, what we can do and what we can do to strengthen the UN and make it make it stronger. So thank you very much for coming this evening and um, hope to see you again this week. Thank you. <laughs>